And welcome everyone to another recording of what is now a regular webinar series. Whether you're joining us live or on replay, a warm welcome to you and we truly appreciate your support. My name is Pascal Fintoni and I have the immense pleasure and privilege of leading on the skills and training elements of two business support programs. The first one is the Digital Drive Candidarum and the other is the digital knowledge exchange um, programs. Both programs have combined forces and resources to deliver what is the most extensive series of online training sessions for you, which is really super news for all of us local businesses. Now today, um, we want to explore how to protect our businesses and data from online threats. And before I introduce you to our special guest, David and Stephen, I'd like to invite my colleagues, Stephen Fennick and Audrey Astoyotas, to remind us about what support is available in both Candidarum and Leeds City regions. So what we'll do is um, we'll start with, um, with Stephen and say a quick hello to you. And um, please tell us again, remind us again about what is available beyond the webinar sessions. Fantastic. Thanks very much to you. Good morning, everybody. Can just do a quick screen share if that's all right with, um, with you, Pat? Yeah. I've got lots. Let me just remove that. Get across. The, and we will do that. Fabulous. So the digital drive offer, um, what we do is with their digital capability and um, so as well as obviously our events program that these webinars are, are kind of part of and um, when we're post-covid obviously we'll have more visit to get back into that so watch out for those guys you know in the future things to happen again at some point and um, but as well as this events program that we do we've also got one-to-one -one support from myself and helen and um, if you're kind of either one of us we can come out and support you over the board and we can talk to you about things like digital marketing and uh, things of that nature and anything really that you, you, you kind of we might be able to sign for you or the support or that so and um, we also have the ability working virtually and um, it's just a case of putting some information into our website and um, letting us know a bit about the digital aspects of your business and then we can create a bespoke report for you and um, that gets sent across and hopefully you find that useful. you can break it apart and um, portion it out to different members of the team to have a little look at so if you had another chance to do that that's possibly quite a good step for you to do at this point in time and then the final thing and probably the most interesting for a lot of businesses is the fact that we have grant funding available so we can fund up to 40 percent of a digital project for you um, the types of things that we typically do are um, things like uh, laptops and desktop computers, iPads, video equipment, podcasting stuff, um, excellent, great stuff at the moment, you know, flexible working going on, ideal to get your team set up, ready to work away from um, the office. You can also support things like consultancy, um, you know, IT process streamlining consultancy, digital marketing consultancy, the obvious ones. Um, also, we can support um, broadband installation, VoIP systems, things like that. And finally, um, the obvious ones, websites, um, app builds, software, um, like platforms such as CRM systems, operations management systems, all of those things are possible um, projects that Digital Drive can help um, with some funding towards. So if you haven't had a chance to have a chat to us about that and you think that's going to be of interest to you, um, then again, um, have a chat with either myself or Helen. Or alternatively, you can come through to these um, contact methods here. So we've obviously got our website listed there, which is just Digital Drive Durham, and um, emails on there as well. You can get us through obviously normal social media channels, we've got a Facebook page and a Twitter, and we're quite active on those. We also share, especially on Twitter, we share quite a lot of other information around. So if Pascal puts some useful information out, which he does quite a lot, we would share that out, you know, to people at Business Durham are putting information out, or our colleagues at MBSL or even NERSU, which is related to cybersecurity, we would share that type of information out. So it's quite encompassing the type of support that we that we try to push out to digital drive. So it's not just purely about us, for example, just saying, you know, we've got a, a webinar coming on tomorrow or something like that. We try to give a, a more encompassing service of what's out there for your, for your digital business support. So I'm going to now pass across to my colleague, Audris, to talk a little bit about the digital knowledge exchange. Um, and then, um, you know, for you guys down at Leeds, that's going to be a lot more interesting than me talking about the Durham stuff. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Pascal. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I can't turn my camera for on for some reason, but I think we'll try to sort that out for within a minute or so. If not, I'll just probably talk over the program without my camera on. Um, all right, okay, one second. Yep. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> so good morning to all of you. Hi, it's yeah. a very, very sunny <laughs> day here in Leeds City region. Um, so like Stephen said, um, our programs are pretty much sister programs. They pretty much do uh, the same thing, but there are slightly there are slight differences between them. So our program is pretty much the same. We'll do over the course of this program, we will do 42 workshops, including webinars like the one you're attending today. We'll do 250 digital audits or online presence reviews. We'll also have 50 business one-to-one -one mentoring businesses. And then we'll have four tech and digital business conferences. And then we'll hold three the digital enterprise top 100 events where, we'll, where we will be celebrating the success and achievements uh, complete, uh, achieved by businesses in our program. And then obviously we've got the digital enterprise helpline where you can email us with all your questions and support that you need. And our team will get back to you as soon as you can. So this program is specifically for SMEs in Leeds city region. Um, and then obviously um, if you need any sort of support, it's fully funded. You get 12 hours of support. Um, and then obviously me and my team will help you with whatever needs you need, um, whether it's digital marketing, uh, or any any sort of digital presence that you may want to increase and, and boost your business with. And in the next slide, you can see where you can um, register your business. So if you go to our website, um, Stephen, if you can click through to the next slide, please. There you go. <laughs> so um, if you go to our website, which is digitalenterprise.co.uk, uh, click register the top menu bar, and then slightly below, you, you need to press register now. And there you can enter all your business information information and our team will get back to you um, with all the um, we'll, uh, they'll get back to you whether or not you're eligible to enter our program and if you are then obviously they will take you through the next steps and in the next slide you can see where you can contact us obviously by going to our website uh, you can email us um, if with any questions that you may have even from today or today's uh, webinar session and obviously feel free to follow us on Twitter and Facebook because we do share some useful tips and tricks um, not on a daily basis, but whenever we can, we do share them. And uh, I'll be, I'll show, I'll be, sh I'll, I'll make sure that I pop these details in the chat box. So, you people, if you don't, uh, if you don't have a note to take at the moment, you'll, you'll, you'll have these details in the chat box. And uh, that's it from me. Uh, thank you. And uh, back to you, Stephen. Thanks very much, Audrey. Much appreciated. Excellent. Well, a big thank you to both of you for, you know, this reminder. There's lots of information to take in, so I always like to hear it again. Um, and to our uh, audience today, live on our replay, do get in touch, even if you have a simple questions, no matter what it is. Um, those two guys, including colleagues behind the scenes, uh, network extensively. They, they know a lot of people in your regions that can sometimes even signpost you in different facets of running a business beyond digital, I'm sure you'd agree. So it's now time to introduce you to our two special guests. I'm going to ask our host and producer, Paul, to bring David and Stephen on screen for me, and then we'll be able to begin our Q&A. Here we go. Excellent. So good morning to you, Stephen. Morning, Pascal. Excellent. So, and we've got David. Good morning to you. Good morning, Pascal. Morning, everyone. Right. So listen, um, I'll start by doing the introduction and embarrass you in front of all these amazing people that come to join us this morning. So um, be welcome to you, Stephen and, and David. David Jemison and Stephen Murphy are the driving force behind Vital Service Northeast Limited. They are passionate and professional uh, and entity operating across many sectors. And their role is to help their client create a secure working environment. They have a simple strap line, protect and prevent. Stephen and David, a warm welcome to you. Hi, Pascal. <laughs> okay, thank you for having us today as well. Um, and again, hello everyone, just uh, thanks for tuning in. 
Now, what is interesting is, um, and for our audience will be, um, I think, reasonably interesting to know that we spoke to each other actually a, a while back, and it was part of our, what we call the last Friday. So the last Friday of every month, we have an um, expert Q&A, a bit of a news roundup, and we learn from this um, kind of your uh, account, what's happening in your specialist area, and then we take on board action points and so on. But we discussed and we met and agree today's uh, agenda before the pandemic yes is that right Do you remember <laughs> yes <laughs> and things have changed slightly i think since then so and things remain the same but yeah definitely <laughs> so i'm very pleased to say that Simon and david have done some extra work for all of us today to add some additional information about you know not only do we need to learn how to protect our businesses and data um in terms of online threats in general but then there's an additional layer when it comes to COVID-19 and the current current pandemic. Now, what is interesting for me is um, I mentioned a moment ago that I'm leading on the skills and digital side of what's um, happening with our businesses. And you understand, David and Stephen, that the interest tends to be around sense of marketing, operations, and so on. But the subject of um, online security and what we need to do as business managers is something that I'm going to argue is, is newer and, and it's making, making it uh, kind of inroads. But as I was preparing for this session, I came across some rather interesting news articles. I'm gonna share them with you now, and I'm gonna get your, your reaction, uh, and then we're gonna start with um, our structured interview, um, if you okay. will. So if I just go straight into, um, for example, um, this article here, which you can probably see on screen, um, cybersecurity apprenticeship helps UK companies fill the skills gap. So I'm going to ask you in a moment how, what you think about it. Um, a month ago, I came across this article, NordVPN report hovers 65% surge in users as remote working increases globally. But actually, if you scroll down and you move to the sub-headline, um, may present its own security problems. I like the way they say may. You may have a, yep. a thought <laughs> yeah. about that. <laughs> Yeah. And then, perhaps more recently, from uh, Info Security Magazine, cyber attacks of 37% over the past month as COVID-19 bites. So, starting with you, David, based on those three articles that were sent to me by the bots out there and AI because of my research, what's your initial reaction to those three headlines? Uh, the bots are very good, and um, the AI is very good. <laughs> um, and I suppose, kind of, how we've how we've seen things kind of uh, change. It, it, can we look kind of pre kind of COVID and things, how, to, how things have adapted then? I think certainly um, what we find is in terms of the, the, the skills aspect, I think that the agenda for the regards to cyber skills has been pushed um, heavily, I think obviously from an industry point of view. Um, I think as we, we have a kind of a changing age in the, the workforce itself, again, we can see some kind of appetite towards that. Um, I, I would also again say that in terms of kind of uh, the, the discussions around kind of cybersecurity, um, information security and data security. Um, there's very much kind of a human and a social um, element of this, but also likewise, there's both kind of the social and the technical components to look at. So one of the things we, we're kind of, we're keen to kind of do with, with regard to this session um, in terms of, kind of any communications is to try to move away from any jargon, to move away from any glossary uh, and look at it in practical terms. Uh, one of the, the kind of the implications that we have around that is that we could start kind of again kind of laboring kind of terms we begin to get lots of technologies but we've obviously found certainly kind of in our experience that it's both again as i said earlier the, the, there's a human aspect of this and there's also kind of the technical components to it so that the skills element allows for communication to happen so we can engage um obviously with individuals so everyone become kind of aware of the situation everyone's in um but also likewise i think there are some remediations that can happen from a technical point of view um which are great and in some cases there may be some fixation towards that, but in reality, as we, as we kind of explore there, it's, it's a mixture between both the person um, and, and the kind of the, the, the technological advice that's in front of them. Um, Super. And the challenge uh, and is, to, is to match up to. Sorry. We'll ask you a lot about, about this today, no doubt. Um, Stephen, your reaction again to, to those headlines? It's very interesting to see that the apprenticeship route is being pushed for this. Uh, it, it's a great thing security kind of does fall in the background quite a bit and it, it always seems to be an afterthought um it, it's one of those that always gets the budget allocated last um it's not really seen as a money making element to the business it's always seen as a cost center and with that you kind of always get that 
it does come last, even when it's got financial implications to the business. Um, just looking at the reports last year, um, SMEs were getting hit anywhere between £10,000 and £25,000 when they did have a breach. Um, and they were saying they were, they were detecting at least one breach every month. So these could be minor ones that don't really get reported up to the ICU, um, all the way up to full breaches where they have lost a lot of data. In terms of the VPN one, it's also a very interesting one, um, especially with the mention of NordVPN and other VPN services that advertise themselves as secure. Um, more so when you don't actually know where their infrastructure is, where what's been logged, where your data goes to once you've visited Facebook or your work system. Um, once it's out there in the ether as well, it's very hard to keep a, a contained lid on it. it. It's out there, it's released. Mm, yeah, we'll explore that together. So listen, what I have in mind for, for, for this morning is to actually invite you to take part in a conversation split into three key areas or key segments, if you will, to use a podcast and radio term. So segment number one, I want us to essentially you know, invite you to let us know about current threats as you understand them and also perhaps what is unique with regard to the current crisis, and then what are the simple adjustments to our behaviors to begin with, and the sensible investment technology that can help us protect and prevent. Then we're gonna move on to segment two, and the segment two is more actually looking into what becomes, in your view, the, the new habits of a business owner manager when it comes to being in tune with regulations, being in tune with you know, changes in criminal activities and so on. If, um, as sense, you want us to embrace your specialism as part of our, the package of digital skills that we have as individuals, then segment two want to explore the new normal, if I may use that term. And then the third one, on, perhaps I may ask you your thoughts and consideration about where are we going with this? What is the, the near future when it comes to cybersecurity? And then we wrap up with some maybe some recommendations. So moving on to segment one, which are current threats, um, both before <laughs> uh, pandemic and then <laughs> during pandemic, and then what to do about it. Um, I'd like to know more about it, but to kind of give, a, give us a sense of what we are talking about. Can you take us through some of the the labels and some of the names that we hear a lot around um, online threats. You know, I'm thinking things like hacking and phishing and malware and all those things. It's all a bit of a blur, perhaps sometimes. Are you happy to pick some of the, forgive me, most infamous uh, terms and give us a lowdown of what they are? Then we can move on to the threats. Yeah, sure. I think one of the kind of one of the starting elements could be. I think if we if we place the kind of the, the internet um, as the wild west. Um, that's kind of how it, how it can exist now. It's, in some cases, it's an explored frontier, but in some cases, it's, kind of, it's very much kind of an unknown frontier. And we've got, again, variations to kind of where people um, exist somewhere. There's very much a gold rush happening as well uh, in certain kind of quarters. So you, can, you get that kind of feel that there's lots of things happening at, uh, at the same time. So there's this kind of um, kind of movement towards um, things, obviously, that, which are threats to information, that sort of thing as well. Um, I think in terms of in terms of the, the, the jargon components, or in terms of kind of some key um, phrases, um, you probably um, hear the, the kind of the word malware. Um, and malware itself, obviously, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shorthand department too, if you like, for um, malicious software. Um, and within that, there are lots of categories within that. So we we traditionally see things like um, viruses, for example, again would would form within malware. But anything that has a, a malicious impact or a malicious intent um, on systems. And again, we're looking at the technical aspect here. Um, anything with regards to anything from a business point of view. So we're looking at the organization, but then likewise, there are elements which could actually have some impact on the individual. So again, we're probably kind of aware of the, the media implications of certain things where um, information has been leaked and that itself has a risk to the organization, has a risk to the system, but also likewise, the end individual um, upstream or downstream of that. Um, and I think again, in the current climate, uh, but also likewise in the previous climate as well, I think, again, the, the privacy of an individual uh, is very much kind of core to the argument um, in terms of what we have. So we have, again, those three levels of the, the system, um, the organization, of course, the, 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 the subject, if you like, the, the individual who could be uh, at risk of this. So malware, as I say, anything which kind of causes harm to systems, um, as I say, we, we, we could link into that things like, again, very much buzzwords or, or kind of um, phrases before that, things like Trojans. Uh, who again they, they, they enter into your organization um, and they cause some significant harm. Worms, again, very much the same. We heard um, of WannaCry uh, and its impact on the NHS. Um, 
obviously not, not too long ago. So again, that was very much very uh, again. Oh, I think we may. Um, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go, go, carry on. <laughs> oh, so, can I ask, can I ask Stephen uh, the one that uh, I've heard actually only um, yesterday on BBC Radio Two, um, fishing. What yes. is that? Um, there's kind of two strands of it. There is typical fishing, which is your bulk mailed out uh, sort of fake emails. They may well come from someone you trust, um, but it will essentially pretend to be something that you are expecting or would generally trust, such as an invoice. Uh, you know, he, he has a pro forma for payments, or he, he has a, a file I want to share with you regarding a previous conversation. And th this is kind of where they're getting quite cheeky. Um, on a bulk level now, er everyone you've seen is getting caught, they're entering a password somewhere and they get access to someone's mailbox. They're then hitting the previous contacts and saying, let's pick the last thousand emails out of their inbox, reply to a conversation and add our malicious file to it. Um, and it could be one of several things they're aiming for. It could be that they're attaching a Trojan horse to get into the organization or a virus or some malware. Um, and one, once you're kind of replying to that thread, you've, you've got the implied trust of the person on the other side. So if John Smith is emailing you back, with a previous conversation where you've got all the thread from top to bottom and it looks real it, it appears to be real it is coming from their email service you you have a real level of trust behind that you trust that you know there, there is a person that you've emailed with that you've worked with and that they are secure and and that's how they're kind of breaking down the doors um, you do also get the, the more kind of mass email shot ones, you know, um, th this is coming from, you know, a .cn address for China and, you know, it's gibberish or it's, it's got funny characters and they're, they're dead easy to spot. But we're seeing less and less of those and more towards this bulk use of credentials they've got with legitimate firms. You can't trust the traditional defences, the traditional technical sort of solutions you put in place because to those solutions, it is in reality, you know, John's or parts or whichever organization in the background and unfortunately they have had a breach and they're being used to breach down the line and eventually the end goal is they, they want some money or they want some sort of information from these organizations and that's how they're reaching in this level of level of trust. Beyond that, there is then spear phishing, which is a highly targeted attack such as uh, let's say you're a multi-million pound organization this is typically where your CEOs or your high flyers in the organization get attacked. These high flyers obviously have lots of power. People tend not to question when they send an email saying transfer money to this account for this charitable project or this, uh, you know, this project for the business that's high priority. Everyone knows about it. It's come with this person's name, even though it's not necessarily them. And, and both of these tax ha have a, a very high level of working on the person, working on the individual, and a lot of it's behind things like fear. Uh, I've, got a, I've got an email from my CEO, I'm time bound, it's, it's really urgent, they're asking for money or whatever, they can't reach the phone, they're stuck in meetings, and they're always playing on these human elements of, I, I need to help them, I, I need to help this person get what they need, I trust them, and people kind of put the defences down that they have built up over the years. Okay. Because uh, sorry, Pascal, I think just one, I, I kind of mentioned before about kind of the, the notion of the, of the the wild west. I think kind of obviously Stephen was going to mention there about the kind of the, the, the door knocking, and I think in, in many ways I think kind of one of the things we kind of have to be vigilant of, um, and I think again kind of some things we're kind of kind of keen to stress. Um, is of course that this is a, it's a it's a it's a it's a criminal activity. You know, it's 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 kind of no different to kind of uh, again kind of door knocking. Um, in terms of again scamming, which may happen on a door knock. Um, again, emails being the kind of the, one of the, the main entry points to an organisation, um, and in some cases a lot easier than going to knock on a door. Um, in terms of verification, in terms of the, there's no kind of physical um, entry at the door. Um, it's very much the same uh, type of activity. Um, it's just a we kind of we internally kind of use an analogy around um, how would you kind of secure your house differently kind of how you secure your computer systems. It's the same sort of kind of process. Um, you would leave the keys in the front door. For example, um, mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily kind of um, always kind of open the door to everyone. Would you always leave your front door open? Um, so these kind of analogies play very much to the kind of information security, cyber security premise, where you're trying to lock down and be secure in your own house and home. And again, if you apply that to your kind of your technical solutions and your your organisation and your infrastructure, there, there's a lot of similarity that exists between the two. So it's it. it as Stephen mentioned before about again how, how people get in their targeted attacks that sort of thing the the, the the criminal activity 
isn't really any different other than the mechanism and actually how they approach. Um, we, we have this, and, and I imagine it's in terms of kind of the second point you mentioned before about kind of the second segment, but some of the kind of the, the kind of the future aspects, of course, is that criminals never, obviously they, they constantly reconfigure. Um, yeah. as, as laws becomes more stringent, as tools and techniques become kind of more um, kind of debilitating for their activities, they reconfigure and try, try something else. So we, we've got this kind of implication now about saying, okay, well, well, how do we kind of keep ourselves up to date with this? So it gets back to your discussion point before about the, the skills aspect. This is kind of certainly one way, um, but I know that kind of certainly, um, and I'm just cut off piece that, so I'm sorry, but in terms right, of kind my of- my job <laughs> to bring it back. I'll bring it back, don't <laughs> worry. But I think certainly kind of with regards to kind of our ethos and, and, and how we kind of want to deliver, um, our, our objective would be is that in, in 10, 15 years time, um, you never hear from us. <laughs> you're, you're, again, you've kind of owned this process yourself. Um, where the analogy of the, the Wild West comes in is, is again, in terms of how that existed, we, we had to have kind of um, external law enforcers. But again, at some point, again, hopefully, again, best practice takes over. Um, Organisations themselves say, okay, this is the best way to approach this. Um, Recognise there is this kind of ongoing threat, but they, they've done everything within their power and strengths and knowledge to say, well, yet we've moved away from this threat um, and we're now uh, better for it as an organisation. Okay, um, so let's yeah. let's go back then. Uh, you're absolutely right. If we are better informed as business owner managers, we can make better decisions and we can also seek out you know, support where, where needed. So can you, and maybe I'll start with you, David, and then you can pick up Stephen as well. What are the, no, forgive me, the normal current threats? So we will put COVID-19 to one side because there's something newer about it. But when we spoke to each other you know, many weeks ago, what are the you know, regular threats that we need to be aware of and then can we move on to what is new for the last you know, two months, give or take? So starting with you, David, what, what, what are the normal ones, the current ones that we need to be aware of? I think to, potentially to, I suppose to, to, to generalize initially in the, in the first instance, so again, forgive me on this one, but I, I think um, the, the biggest threat I think we kind of understand is that it's not a case of <laughs> if, if, but when. So it very much kind of focus there. Again, that, that could be someone just losing a single document. That could be someone deleting the wrong record. That could be someone, again, infiltrating someone's systems um, via uh, different means. And, and some of the, the, the things we, we mentioned before about how they do that, so the use of malware, the use of phishing, um, incorrect passwords. Um, again, um, not strong enough passwords, reuse passwords, that sort of thing. Which again, from a technical point of view, I'm sure Steve will jump on <laughs> it is too, uh, time. Uh, but I, I think, as I say, kind of, if we use the analogy there, that as I say, um, it's not a case of, um, uh, if but when and then have a look at it from a different perspective that says right okay everyone and again we mean in terms of the, the hundreds of organizations we've engaged with um actively that we've seen um in terms of kind of uh, best practice applications uh with regards to kind of links that we have uh, in the us um again it, everyone has a low hanging fruit and again very opportunistically again if we use the analogy of um, people in their homes and how people secure homes um we have different attitudes to how we secure our homes, what insurance products we use, that sort of thing. And again, the same applies to from a cybersecurity point of view. It's the same element, but just in a digital perspective. Um, so everyone has these low hanging fruits. Our rule, whether or not we kind of, uh, either from an active engagement point of view, or again, um, uh, kind of sessions like this in terms of how we can kind of educate the community, um, is, a, is effectively to, um, to not allow you to have as low hanging fruit. So the steps you can do to kind of, okay, here's the best practice elements you have. So do you have something where um, you have passwords? Do you have things like two-factor authentication like your, your banks use? Sorry, I dropped in a buzzword there. Um, but, you know, it's about these other, other techniques which are... Okay, well, let me stop you there. Sorry, yeah, 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 sorry. No, no. What is a two-factor <laughs> authentication password? What, so, what is it? So, so two factor is um, obviously is obviously consists of two elements. One is um, something that you know, so your password, your physical kind of keyboard, and person. And the next one is something that you have. So it's something which is, again, you possess yourself. Um, everyone is probably more than likely now in terms of how they use that now um, in terms of banking access. You have a, a unique generator code every 30 seconds um, and that allows you to uh, input a brand new code. So unless someone has your physical <laughs> kind of uh, device, they cannot get that code. Um, and that's now we're, 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 the good news again from kind of our perspective is um, a lot more people are beginning to kind of uh, take this up. Um, and again, it's very, very useful. Um, and in, in, in terms of security aspects, again, you need these two things together in order to kind of uh, to work together. So two-factor authentication was something that we very much advocate. Um, again, some people see this being overkill because it's just another step to go through. Um, but the offset would be in terms of a minor inconvenience against 
kind of downstream to that of kind of a very large uh, inconvenience when that happens. All right. Um, Stephen, is there another um, low hanging fruit? So something that we need to, to watch out for? Um, definitely. I mean, it's something our class is the basics, which is keeping things like an up to date antivirus that that's well rated and has a good performance. Um, you know, that there's, there's often tests like AV comparators where they run through the products on the market and, you know, not every product is the same as every other. The, the effectiveness is what of one product might only be 40, 50%, uh, whereas other products without naming them are up in the high 90s. Um, and Could unfortunately, ask, you know, when it comes to products, do you get what you pay for in your world? Yes. Yes. I am. Sorry, I'll stop it there again. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. It, when it comes to, to pain, it's not always the case that it is the most expensive. There are some very cost effective right. products that are very effective. Um, without naming vendors, obviously, have a look out on the AV comparatives tests. They, they do these tests every month. They then run through quarterly tests and it's quite public and they, they rate them dead easy, um, much like you used to. He, he has our top rated products and you do see some names consistently up there. And they're the kind of ones that you want to put into your organization. Okay. They're always up there, they're always breaking ground. Yeah. So we've got, you know, let's be a bit more um, careful and professional about the password and, and the management of passwords. Let's make sure that, you know, we equip ourselves with the, the tools that are going to help us protect and prevent. Uh, anything else that comes to mind, Stephen, as a low hanging fruit? Yes, certainly. Um, again, this is very much seen as a cost or a time center in the business, and it's keeping things up to date. Getting rid of old, outdated software. Yes, it may be critical to the business, and it's been running for 20 years, 30 years. Uh, I'm well aware of some organizations that are still using MS-DOS, unfortunately, but uh, things have moved on with those times. Um, but it does, it does a job for them, so they don't see it as a risk to the organization. Unfortunately, as we've seen with things like WannaCry, you get these out of date operating systems that have vulnerabilities. They cannot be patched, they cannot be fixed, and they're always going to be the low hanging fruit. It's the easy way into the network. You can then sidestep, much like you see a basketball player kind of twirl around another player and get round. You've got in at the easy point and you're away. The, door, the door's wide open and they're straight into the network. I like that basketball analogy, I have to say. It's really, really quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so now, so you know, um, so we've got password. We've got you know, uh, protecting ourselves with, with the right tools. Let's be careful of our loyalty and our romantic view by using you know those older software because change is always you know a tricky one. David, is there any other low hanging fruit we need to be careful about? Um, I, th I think it, it, yes. I mean, one aspect is around kind of um, again, kind of more about the the human aspect. Um, so again, not to kind of again cast cast kind of um, doubt on people, but again employees. Um, so again, again that human element. Um, so if you have um, interaction with employees, so it's about understanding. Okay, are they aware of their, their roles and responsibilities when it comes to information security and cyber security? Um, so are the devices that they're using uh, are they up to date? Um, and again, of course, this applies to the kind of the, the current kind of uh, climate as well. Um, in terms of kind of processes to uh, how you how you and they handle data. So again, um, what access do they have, have as part of that? Do they have the right um, access permissions in place? Um, do you have a free for all in terms of your access? Um, is the information being removed from your network? Um, or, or again, is it very much kind of secure in, in its place? Um, what happens when you kind of take employees on? So are you educating them correctly? Gets back to the kind of the cyber skills aspect as mm -hmm. a large extent. But again, if you, again, in the current climate, uh, if they are being uh, furloughed or if they gain, if they, um, obviously if they have to be let go, um, again, what rights and permissions do they have? Um, where again, in this very much kind of um, internet connected world, so a lot of people are seeing kind of systems which are very much available out uh, in the outside world um, used corporately. So for example, if you as an organization have um, use a tool like um, OneDrive or Dropbox, again, that will be ex um, accessible outside of the organization, outside of 905, outside of bricks and mortar. So again, kind of what controls, if any, do you need to kind of put in place? Um, it, it's very much kind of that, that risk assessment aspect, um, which 
again, obviously we, we kind of advocate, um, but again, in terms of it, again, the, um, the granularity of that, again, obviously is very much dependent on the organization. Great. Right. So well, that, that, that human aspect is definitely. Yeah, that gives me a wonderful segue to ask you about then what's been happening the last month and a half, two months now. So let me give you a scenario. You know, I, I'm on my own, you know, I run my own, my own business. I operate within normally in the business center and now I've been working from home, uh, therefore, you know, working remotely. Um, are there therefore some some threats or some issues that I was not um, aware of because I was in a business center working a particular way and now I'm at home using you know my kind of home Wi-Fi and trying to get on with with work are there things inherently in your view risky about that can you just remind us what's happening in the world now Pascal we're not, we're not aware of it <laughs> <laughs> I think I think obviously kind of gets back to the the Nord VPN aspect in terms of kind of you know, the article we kind of mentioned um, kind of earlier. Um, it, w again, we've seen a, a massive ramp up in kind of clients working remotely. Um, so again, as you could have identified, there are certain considerations. Um, for example, um, is it a personal laptop? Is it a personal device that someone may be using to access um, kind of work related uh, uh, documents and platforms, infrastructures? Um, applications um, as a result of that what happens to that data um, how secure is that that device so again Steve mentioned before about um, looking at the antivirus aspect it, it, it's very much kind of well um, you may have a corporate solution in place you may have something which is very personal or again um, as again as we've seen um, devices don't have any antivirus on um, the antivirus is, is present but it's not licensed it's not subscribed to so you haven't got the latest updates um, from a remote access point of view again uh, or organizations using um, VPNs so no VPNs there before, are they connecting to organizations? If they are, that presents a very big security risk uh, because what you're having is effectively internet traffic from the internet to the floor of that device. And then of course, across your network um, in terms of implications there. Um, there's also aspects of capacity and demand. Um, so again, kind of what we've again experienced with certainly with some of our clients is um, you've now got 50, 50 members of staff working from home where previously you didn't have any um, mm -hmm. is, is your internet connection up to it? <laughs> um, and that itself means that people then do um, uh, workarounds to, effectively to get access to certain things. So they have copy files off the server. So when they're offline, they, they have the server. And it, but again, they're kind of very much divorced from the actual physical network itself. Um, so that becomes very much a problem uh, overall. Um, one of the things, again, that links back to, um, I suppose, again, the, 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 the kind of the jargon aspect is around the notion of encryption. Um, so again, if we're using personal devices or again, even if we're using corporate devices, are those devices encrypted and themselves? And again, that obviously applies to kind of now the regulatory stances about um, can you get support from the information commissioner's office around uh, devices um, and of course GDPR, um, which I might have got to in later on. Um, but so th there's, there's kind of, again, lots of things that kind of thread together around this, this aspect. Um, so because you could actually have um, kind of like I have with, with kind of my kids, I've got a kind of a, a laptop sitting there um appreciate it's a completely separate network and doing kind of different things there but it's again um what are the what, what is their activity there so if i give if i take that laptop off the kids later on and then begin to use it where have they been what have they done uh, if i start checking emails down in the network again what are the implications there about what happens so it's it's about these again this this level of consideration does your your fruit just begin kind of again getting kind of lower and lower down the scale of actually just saying okay well the next time i begin to use it i mean we need to just like tidy that that, that little hanging fruit of a game. So, Got sorry, it, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if it's a really good analogy, but it's it's, it's no, no, it, it, it really it helps. Of, yeah, yeah, it, it so, 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 yeah, so, 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 Stephen, in terms of uh, sadly the activities of you know criminals out there or people with um, more time in their hands than than the, you know uh, they should, are you have you noticed you know a different type of attempt at breaking into someone's virtual home? in reference to COVID-19 and the pandemic? Um, very much so. Um, the, there is a warning out at the moment uh, via the FBI, uh, very much dictating <laughs> to be aware of the, the World Health Organization as being targeted. They're very much aiming for the, the large drive in healthcare in the States. And it, it is a very interesting one that, again, whatever's in the news, whatever's popular, whatever people are actively looking for, they're exploiting. They know it's on people's minds. They know that people are aware of it and are researching these. So you tend to find the top of Google, the ad words are being used to drive up these malicious sites, that these have become the phishing campaigns via email. 
um, a, a, along with other things like your old school mail. They're, they're getting letters where you know he has he has the equivalent of the stimulus check that the, the Americans are doing. In reality, it's actually a loan you're signing with you with a new company, and the, they've got sky high uh, rates on the interest of that twelve hundred dollars. And unfortunately, it's borderline criminal, but the law allows them to do so. In terms of the, the spam, though, they are very much exploiting COVID-19. This is our yeah. updates. And then on the back of that, there's a malicious attachment signing here out of view. And again, they're, they're looking for those easy to hit usernames and passwords. They know that you're using those passwords elsewhere. The password reuse is rife. I'll admit I've done it myself. Even on all the accounts I've had 10 years ago, I've suddenly got notifications on my phone. Thankfully, the two-factor goes, are you signing in from the Ukraine or Russia or China? And you go, well, I'm definitely not. <laughs> um, but you just wonder, where, where have you reused that password? How have they linked it to you? Even though that's an account that's about five email addresses for me personally, they've still managed to link it. And it, it, it's just an unfortunate thing. They, they are it, aiming for the it, it, I think it, we'll probably kind of see it soon, obviously with regards to kind of, again, kind of from a business point of view. Um, certainly with regards to that, I mean, again, uh, from a business owner perspective, obviously we've had a kind of a, a flood of kind of emails from HMRC. Um, again, how long before, and I appreciate HMRC, you've got um, kind of its verification process spot on, you know, that we won't include any personal details, that sort of thing within the emails. We won't ask you to click on links, which mm -hmm. just get in touch with us. And it, so it's, it's really good, good how HMRC have done it. Um, but I think, again, in terms of the, um, obviously in terms of the, the corona aspect, I suppose again, kind of Stephen hit on the nail, the nail on the head there again. What we're seeing is kind of this this, this kind of um, emotion override. Um, again, organisations themselves think, oh, we're going kind to of begin to. Um, this looks legitimate in terms of kind of what we're being sent, uh, what we're beginning to receive, the conversation we're beginning to have, um, and then of course that's then being jumped on the back of it. So I haven't seen any yet per se, um, but I, I, we can imagine in time that kind of um, HMRC um, again will be spoofed. So again, another kind of uh, term there to, where you kind of impersonate someone. Um, and again, I think we'll probably kind of see more of that. Um, again, how, how do we kind of begin to resolve this? Again, very much the human element. Be aware of this. Uh, again, we've got some kind of some kind of very astute and excellent clients ourselves who kind of, again, I'll ask us to check is it the validation of this. Again, they know the process to kind of delete um, out of junk, that sort of thing. So it hopefully never happens again. Um, but and of course, there was the, the technical components. Um, so solutions now. Uh, which again, a vast majority of organizations are using around um, Microsoft 365 and Google's G Suite, that sort of thing, where they've got very powerful kind of spam filters in themselves. Uh, but of course, things do kind of eke through as part of that. Um, but the, the, as I say, the, it's they're, they're riding the coattails of people's emotions and kind of current events. Uh, no, but I, I just said that it's been around for, for centuries, sadly. Yeah. Um, I mean, using the analogy of Wild Wild West, you know, it's like people selling that miracle cure. It is, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as people were, were crippled Moonshine, by mining. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to address our audience today. If you have um, any questions um, in and around the subject we're talking about today, please put them into the chat box. We're going to move on to the Q&A um, in a moment. So do feel free to type those questions but for now uh, I'm going to ask you some questions Stephen and, and, and David and almost trying to get I know you can't give us some direct answers and solutions because you don't understand our businesses and what we do necessarily but some kind of signposting in the right direction so um, I'm going to ask questions more about behavior before COVID-19 and then after so before COVID-19 what is your views and reaction when someone goes and in, to Starbucks for example and start working there I'll start with an easy one. Do you want the, uh, well, <laughs> are you, you are you're speechless? I managed to get David to actually be speechless. I'm, sorry. I'm looking at Steve. I'm thinking panic, okay. panic from David. <laughs> it's not, it's not, I promise. You. I mean, I'm, I've, I've, I've asked, as someone who's an advocate of that that, that process. Um, so, I mean, again, transparency-wise, um, the, the, the we've worked from home for uh, the past since the last nearly eleven years. So for us, kind of the, the kind of the, the current situation, apart from this, the social integration, um, it, it's kind of water for ducks back. We, we've done that. Um, we've took things to, from an extreme perspective of saying, okay, we must have everything locked down kind of on our homes um, to, okay, let's actually have a look and, and, and let's understand these rules a bit better. So we've, we've worked at kind of both extremes. Um, individually, we've both got obviously kind of different interests, but again, we kind of, we converge on this kind of notion of influence security. Mm -hmm. um, so as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm very much an advocate of that, of kind of where it works. I think, however, um, where, what obviously that does for us is, and, and I think, again, very much the, the aspect of public Wi-Fi itself presents itself as an opportunity and threat um, for obviously two reasons. 
in some cases we can't validate what that organization is we can't in some cases even validate um that if we walk into starbucks that it's actually starbucks providing that um internet connection um again there are other techniques which people can use um one of which is known as a honeypot attack where people simulate that you're actually connect connecting to starbucks but in reality how, not how do they do that so what they do is um, on their laptop they will have an external um uh, wireless connection um what happens is, is in they'll they'll pre um they'll present the starbucks um network name so what you do is your laptop says okay i can see starbucks i'll go and connect it there um they'll they'll spoof a screen that says okay pascal put your kind of details in here click go you'll then be passed through to the internet but then they've got your email address then at which point all your internet connectivity in your traffic is flowing through their machine so again and, and again obviously from an ethical point of view we've we demonstrated this in, in, in practice and process um, but things like, for example, at the time, Facebook, you could actually scrape your Facebook login, so include your username and password. Um, it's actually called a man in the middle attack. So you're between kind of your mm -hmm. device, um, them, and then the internet. And what actually happens is all the internet traffic passes through their device and they begin to see that. Um, so it, it, that's very much kind of a threat in itself. Um, obviously, as well, they're, they're, public, um, they're public environments. So it's not just kind of Pascal and David who's connected. It's Pascal and Stephen and David. Um, Stephen could be malicious, but also likewise, Stephen may not be malicious intentionally, but Stephen may have a virus on his computer. Okay, so well, how do we, again, in some cases where we may, we cannot prevent the fact that Stephen has to um, communicate with everyone else. And then of course, what we have there is some, some kind of uh, formal transmission. It could be, of course, again, get back to the analogy where we're using personal devices, where they haven't been um, uh, hardened, as it's kind of we call it, so all the security is very much open. So they've got Windows 10 Home on, for example, where again, a lot of things are kind of open by default. Um, you're added to that kind of uh, Wi-Fi network. Again, do you have your, have you shared your photos with the family? If so, can I now see your photos when I log on to um, start the Starbucks network? And chances are, yes, we can. Um, so can I start again extracting some uh, data off, off your devices? Have you inadvertently saved a spreadsheet into your photos folder? Um, so or Stephen, then, uh, uh, you know, what is your recommendation? Do, do we do we stop using public Wi-Fi, um, you know, coffee houses and trains and so on, or do we have a system in place to prevent and protect? I mean, it doesn't answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to pick up on something that Stephen uh, Barrett said there, um, saying about always oh, hotspotting to the mobile phone when they're out and about and working. Yeah, yes, that's that's perfect. perfect. You, guarantee, you you have a trusted device that's connected to O2 or who the mobile provider is, and you have a personal password on that device. No one else knows it. Hopefully, they haven't seen it on the screen when they've been stood behind you. Just as a uh, You've got to appreciate that there are other people in these spaces. So what are you opening? But in terms of that, get yourself onto a trusted device, something you know, um, it, like a hotspot for a phone, or if you've got one of those MiFi dongles where it's a SIM card and it, it, it just transmits it to a Wi-Fi network, get yourself on those. You can trust them. You know that you've had the device in your possession and, and that it hasn't been tampered with. The issue with public Wi-Fi is uh, th there is a technical reason behind all of this. Some Wi-Fis are very good. Um, certain vendors set them up by default where you can't see another device. You try and communicate with that other device. They, they're stopping this spoof attack. They, they know that there are other networks out there, and they have dedicated defense radios that stops these spoofs. Um, you try and connect to this wrong access point, it will drop you off from the wrong access point and try and prevent you from ever touching it. Um, in, ter in terms of the guest Wi-Fi, though, some of these guest Wi-Fi are wide open. You can literally, I've, I've went to a hotel myself, turned my laptop on, and you can just scan the network. Um, there are certain hotels when, I, when I've been out and about in the UK where you go far and wide, you run the scan and you can see their, their front desk computer. You can see their server that you know is processing and holding the details of all of the staff, all of, all of the workers who come in and deal with it or, or are busy talking over that network to that, that server. When they're pulling payments, it's... So, so is, that, is that what you do in, in your spare time? You just run scans when you, you travel around? <laughs> that's what he does. I'm not going to lie. That's what he does. <laughs> it, 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 it's a legal line. So it, it, at the point where you actually interact with it, that's when it becomes illegal. Observing it and, and not interacting with it, you, you get to observe that maybe these things aren't up to scratch. Maybe it's a bit of a worry that my, my credit card details are sitting with these card terminals on the same network. Um, it, it, could could it, I ask the uh, the scan that you run? Uh, is it something that, forgive me, only specialists like you have access to? Or five minutes on Google, and you can get these tools. Um, the, the, 
this, I mean, there's another thing it's just added, I think, by default. So it kind of uh, max. I appreciate you've got a Mac as well, uh, uh, Pascal as well. But again, Macs and Windows by default, um, they, they they begin to scan the network. Um, so they'll. If, I don't know if you've noticed before, if you look in Finder, for example, on a Mac, um, if, if you go to a public space and you connect with public Wi-Fi, you'll see all the devices on the left-hand side in Finder. Um, mm. Within Windows, it's exactly the same. If you want to network, it just begins to kind of again. The the the, the plug and play technology, which was um, introduced kind of in the in the mid two thousands, um, kind of more widespread. Um, it, it's obviously got its pros and cons. It's great in the home environment. So yeah, I want to see where, where my kind of my Sonos player is or um, where my kind of um, streaming TV is. It's great. But of course, the same applies. Again, it's this, this, this aspect of kind of the personal device in, in, in the workspace and vice versa. Um, again, the same rules apply. Mm. Um, so it, 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 it's about that. So again, from a remediation point of view is, okay, do we switch that off? Do we not use it? And again, because we've got so many options around <laughs> in terms of, kind of what's best and what's not, um, again, it's, it's okay, kind of where, where's my fruit? How low is, how low is my fruit again? So, so um, unfortunately, time is against us. We need to bring this first segment almost to, to a close. So I've got one last question, then I will ask um, my friend Stephen uh, Fennick to read out some of the questions we've, we have in the chat room. Um, um, yeah, all the scenario for you, which I think is uh, building on what you mentioned a moment ago. Uh, I've got, obviously, um, a business. I've got my own premises and so on. And sometimes we, we have a guest that comes in and said, oh, you know, can I hot desk for a bit before I go to my next meeting? And then we share, obviously, our um, um, Wi-Fi login details with someone that is external to, to the business because we are very nice people. But do you see um, a risk inherent in, in doing that? Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. Um, in, in terms of, um, obviously, what that means is that, Again, if it's the same kind of flat structure in terms of your <laughs> Wi-Fi, so obviously what that means is that if you have access to your server, um, again, in, you, in, in that way, you then give that same password so that person participates in the same network you're participating on, they've now got access to your server. And yes, there may be uh, passwords in there, and yes, it may be great. Um, however, of course, there may be kind of other, other implications. Um, certainly, again, in terms of some, some of the regulatory kind of uh, components, they recommend that obviously that doesn't happen, that you have two different networks um, that, can, that provide that. Um, as you see, in some cases, it's, it's kind of nigh impossible to do that. Um, because of course you may only have a single router, you um, only have certain environments, but then again, it's okay, well upstream of that, if we do have a server at the end of that, okay, is a password protected? Can anybody just kind of rummage around it? Um, is it open to everyone in terms of permissions and shares and that sort of thing? Um, so again, it's it's not just saying, okay, let's kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's understand, okay, kind of again, that element of risk and equally of threat, um, what does that actually kind of look like for us? So have we tested it? Have we got a, uh, have we just kind of got a brand new laptop or a, a, another laptop in here, put it in here, and try and access components of your, your kind of network. Um, it's, it's those kind of, again, considerations where certainly we've seen um, organizations come, come, um, come afoul of that. Um, yeah. So it, 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 it's those, those aspects. What and I think about, it's sorry. back to what you were saying earlier, you know, it's, it's behavior. We want to be kind, we want to be generous, we want to be hospitable um, because emotions are running high at the moment. You know, I, yeah. I get an email from um, my local you know, clinic or surgery, I'm going to read it, and they're asking me to make an appointment, even though it's not them because they've been spoofed and so on. And, and it's just, um, I mean, I made one mistake, you know, quite recently because I was rushing. And because I was rushing, I clicked. And it was almost moments later, I went, oh, that wasn't them, that wasn't, that wasn't PayPal. I thought it was PayPal, it wasn't at all. Yeah. But because I was rushing and I got a bit irritated with the, being distracted by PayPal. Um, so I think we need to just keep in check our emotions, even though some of them are you know, very sincere and, and honest. So Stephen, before we move on to um, the question from our audience today, are you able to summarize for us maybe the key essentials when it comes to the, the mitigating actions we can take, you know, the simple steps, adjustments we can take in terms of our behavior and the technology to uh, protect and prevent? Um, yeah, it, it's dead easy. It, it's always starting back with the basics. So make sure you've got a good protection platform, good antivirus. Um, if you're willing to go up the next step, um, there, there is a, a bit of software called an ADR or an endpoint detection response. I, I wouldn't expect someone to personally have that level of uh, virus protection, but basically it will monitor what is going on your device. You've opened this for the attachment, what has this touched thereafter and worked with. So you, you can at least find out what has happened when you, you've opened that attachment and what it's actually touched on your network. 
and what did you call that again? Sorry. Uh, endpoint detection and response. Um, endpoint so, detection and, and response. People can Google that, yeah. Yes. So whereas typically you can pay 30, 40 pounds a year for antivirus, um, those, those sorts of products do rule into sort of five and 10 pounds a month. So it, it's not a cheap cost, but it's something where you can guarantee they are logging everything that's happening on your computer. They know that, you know, this malicious PDF from supposedly from an in, invoicing company has been opened. It touched this file on the server and that's kind of where you can start to remediate and know exactly what happened. In terms of that, it, it's always patching. Pa patch your devices, keep them up to date. Those phone updates that you've been ignoring that the prompt's very annoying with, please do them. Um, iPhones, are very iPhones are very much uh, <laughs> updating them in the night, and it, it, it's a much easier process for iPhone users. Whereas if only they can make them more, more interesting and exciting when we receive them, you know? <laughs> yeah, not too long. Not, as long. not as long. I think that's a part of the problem. <laughs> well, it is that. It always falls back to time. Uh, people don't have time to step away from the computers. They're always busy. And they've got a fear that these updates are going to fail and then the device becomes unusable. Mm -hmm. um, for, as IT companies, we've got to take the handle of, we've got to update them, we've got to protect these devices. These vulnerabilities are no longer, you know, shots in the dark where they might get exploited. They are exploiting them actively. There's a flaw out at the moment for iPhone that hasn't been patched, whereby if you receive a certain email on mail as an app, they can actually root the phone and have full control of it. They can then delete the email that came in. You would never have a trace of it. And they, they get full, device, full control of a device literally by sending an email and it, it gets opened by the device. Not even that you've interacted with it as a user. The patch for that is coming. I expect that in a week or two. And yep. uh, hopefully that, sh that should be the end of that version of it. Once it's patched. Fingers crossed. There, there will always be more patches because there's always vulnerabilities. Human Stephen, we've got a quick query. We'll move on to all, all the other questions with um, yep. my colleague Stephen Fenning. But um, Pamela asking, can you repeat the name again? That this it was called Endpoint. Yes. Endpoint. Sorry, I'll, I'll type it in as well. Uh, Brilliant. So, so you know, really, the, the reason why I was so keen to have both of you um, with us to almost start a conversation we're going to have for as long as we're trading is I do believe that it is part of what we need to do to inform ourselves, educate ourselves, take it as far as, you know, is sensible as a business owner manager with different talent and skill set. But if we want to be a digital business, uh, in addition to the sense of marketing and an operation and online customer service and all those things, let's, let's do what we can. Uh, and so far I, I, I'll ask, you know, the feedback from the attendees, but I've not heard anything from you that seems uh, difficult or not attainable, if that makes any sense. But Stephen, uh, Stephen Fennick, the other Stephen, do we have any questions or comment from our attendees joining us live today? We certainly do. That's All right. Quite a few, actually. Um, so let's get rolling. Um, great webinar so far, guys, by the way. Uh, really, really interesting. I'm enjoying it. Um, so Stephen asked a little while ago, well, more of a comment really, um, that he's finding it quite annoying that he's getting quite a lot of spam emails coming through his Magento website contact page. So I suppose just to kind of phrase that into a question, how would you, I mean, it's probably going to be quite difficult, but how would you go about kind of preventing that or, you know, kind of preventing it as much as possible? Do you want me to get this one on? David, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start with David then, see if you can get the next one. So there's probably, probably uh, two things uh, around that. So obviously with Magento being a kind of a, a, a plug-in kind of style CMS, they're, they're, again, like WordPress, there are elements of which you could uh, enable so that the, there's a verification process which happens uh, as part of the kind of the um, request more information, find more information, email more details, that, that, that component as well. So there, there's certainly some elements we could do, with, um, sorry, you could kind of suggest around there. Um, the other aspect, again, is around um, potentially uh, email system that, that, is, that has been used in place. Um, one of the questions could be, of course, is um, could you put, put, put particular rules in place to say, okay, well, we know it's from this. Um, can we validate that the sender is from this uh, kind of uh, organization? Um, however, I suppose kind of the, the, kind of the, the, the trouble you may be, ha may be having is around um, the exposure um, of the current plugin that you have for uh, capturing uh, information uh, on the Magento site. Uh, so again, we, we've had a, again, a, a fair bit of experience where people have used plugins that don't validate. Um, so again, we could put a spurious email address in there. Um, 
and it doesn't follow any rules. Um, so as a result, it just kind of just gets the the, the request and then sends it across. Um, what kind of validation, sorry, um, would you see fit into have? What kind of validation would work? Yeah. I mean, if we, if we, was, if we looked at a traditional email, so going slightly off piece, I suppose there, a traditional email, you would say, okay, well, well I'm, am I expecting any emails from China? As Stephen said before, um, are, are we expecting kind of emails from, from Russia or uh, Ukraine? If not, don't send them. Um, so again, kind of quarantine those emails. So that, that would happen very much in a mail server um, element. Um, again, in terms of plugins, uh, we're aware, obviously from a WordPress point of view, there are some fairly powerful ones that kind of produce the, the, reduce the spam. Um, and I'm just wondering if it's a, it's a case, certainly from a website point of view, that it's looking at, okay, do you, can you swap out um, the kind of current contact or get in touch sort of um, form, which does this um, element of, of verification. Um, I think, again, there are obviously kind of a lot of free tools that, that do this as well. There's free ones which have been validated, again, equally, certainly from a WordPress point of view and a Magento point of view, that may not be validated. Um, so it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of a, Again, kind of do your research and do your kind of due diligence around kind of some, some elements of tools that could be used. Um, Thank you very much. Um, next question for Stephen, please. Yes, and um, we've had um, Charlotte and Simon ask, um, does Apple need antivirus? Obviously, it's quite a robust operating system. We then had Chris just chip in to say that he uses AVG on his MacBook Pro. And just a peace of mind, really, feels that it does regular scans, blocks any threats. So what's your take on that, guys? Yes. Please use it. Um, it. It's not only protecting you, it's protecting your other devices that are on the network and anyone you're contacting. Even though Macs aren't as susceptible to malware, it does happen, but they, they are, again, they are not the low-hanging fruit in this situation. Mac is not mm -hmm. sitting with the market penetration and the use that Windows devices are, um, but they do still get them. They are, they are still a target because they know that they tend to be more affluent users. They, they tend to have uh, systems that are more well-connected with, with business systems. Um, in terms of what the antivirus tends to do as well, it'll also scan for malware that works on Windows devices. So even though you might have a bit of Windows malware yeah. on your Mac as a file, that might not necessarily mean that when you're sharing it with another person, they don't have a Windows device. You might think it's a totally innocent PDF and it doesn't work on Mac. Uh, and then when you find out you've sent it to your colleague who is using a Windows device, it's, it's actually malicious. So those antiviruses are searching for both Mac malware and they are also searching for Windows malware. And in protecting you, in protecting every device is kind of the key ideal on this. And so back to what you were saying, if I was to select a um, you know a tool, a solution that I'm going to pay monthly or as a one-off annual fee, your preference would be for a tool that does virus and malware, as opposed to just the antivirus. Um, these days it's elevated up to, they include modules such as phishing, they include modules such as web filters, and you can protect yourselves from these malicious uh, domains. Um, the, the kind of comparison that's always used in the security industry, it's like layers of an onion. You, you've got your antivirus. If you then search for bad websites, you've got another layer because you can't get to those bad websites and get the, the malicious file. So even if the, the antivirus engine can't cope with it, at least the web filter has blocks. You get into that potential attachment. That's, that's nasty. Um, you also tend to find they've got things built in um, on certain modules. There are certain vendors where they, once you're on a banking website, they actually put the banking website in a, what's called a sandbox. It's totally isolated. It's, it's protected in its own right. These kind of layers of modules um, with certain vendors is where you're seeing the more comprehensive protection. Doing as many things as possible will elevate you to the point where you're, you're the, not the easy target anymore. You're not leaving your car doors open at night or your front door unlocked all day, and that makes it harder for them to get to you. Um, same with the spam protection. You tend to find that Office 365 and G, G Suite or um, Google Apps, as, as they also call them, uh, they've got really good filtering systems. But again, at an admin level, they need to be tweaked and set up and they'll become more effective. You'll start to see a reduction of these spam and nasty emails that you're getting all the time. Thank just you add, very much. Uh, sorry, Pascal, can I just add, um, obviously I mentioned before about kind of the, the aspect of kind of uh, diligence around kind of certain components that you may use. Um, and as you say, that this is probably kind of one of the easier ways to kind of, again, um, obviously kind of uh, understand and ensure kind of what it is you're doing. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's aware, but um, it, um, Avast is an antivirus product um, obviously, kind of what, what kind of came out recently, kind of certainly inside the industry, uh, was some of the nefarious activities that Avast had actually undertaken. Um, so Avast themselves, again, as, an, as a trusted antivirus uh, provider, were actually kind of downloading data 
um, and from the actual machines themselves. Um, and I think it, again, it was kind of, there was a, obviously links somewhere else, but so rather than what was obviously deemed a trusted kind of uh, product, uh, and in some cases, this is where Zoom has been kind of trusted again, kind of mm-hmm. again, where, where they the press recently as well. Um, so again, something that we trust them are using every day. But again, there is something kind of, as I say, nefarious and something underpinning as part of that. So I think again, from a tool selection, again, while we could obviously kind of recommend obviously kind of some kind of best cases, again, appreciate that that there may not be for everyone in terms of kind of how this is maybe configured. But again, the the recommendation would be again is, is do some due diligence, which I think is what Steve was kind of inferring before about look at these tools, look at kind of where they are. Um, Again, and obviously in this case, ironically, Google is your friend um, with regards to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please, uh, Stephen. No problem. Thank you, guys. Um, yes, yeah, so I think Pamela makes a really good point here, which I think you guys will, will almost certainly agree with. And um, what she believes is that cybersecurity is not a case of fire prevention. Is it not a case of fire prevention instead of firefighting? And um, she's had experience of people not updating their software and not realizing the protection value of it. So I think that's quite a good point and probably uh, something you'll agree with. It, 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 if I can take the kind of the fire kind of analogy um, a little bit, um, I think that there's, there's always a smoldering fire somewhere. And I think that at some point there, there are fuels which, can, the fuels which can be added to that, which obviously again make it kind of a bigger fire. So it, it, is, it is a perfect comment um, because it's, it's, again, as Stephen alluded to before, something which may, in, in, I suppose we're getting labouring the cost element now, or again, time, even if we use time as a cost, if something which takes five minutes now, it may prevent you kind of an hour, two hours uh, later on. Plus, likewise, something which kind of takes five minutes now may prevent you from £5,000, £10,000 later on. Um, it, so I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, it, it, as I said, the only thing I, I would probably kind of add to that would be to say, well, there's always a smouldering component there somewhere. Um, and it, and it can it ready to kick off at any point. Um, so our iPhones now could be kind of perfectly up to date, but tomorrow they may be out of date. And, it, and again, it's that, that currency aspect about um, how up to date are they. Thank you. Stephen, next question, please. Yeah. Um, so Nariko just saying that she uses the free version of WordFence plugin on her WordPress website, which is WooCommerce. Um, do you think if the, if the free version of WordFence, WordFence plugin is safe enough to run on a website? Yes. Um, they're very much selling a solution um, and, and they don't want to taint their name. It, it, it is a, a solution we've used with customers before, if, especially when they don't have a budget to protect themselves. And it, it does have a basic level of protection that is beyond the normal install. You, you've got another layer there. You've got a protection against certain levels of spam, You know, people attempting passwords on the website and having that extra level of protection is always a good thing. Smashing, thanks. Next, please, Stephen. Yes, just Rachel asking, um, she's had a few phishing emails. However, last week she received one whereby they knew the password um, that she had from a few years ago. Do you know how they might have got that information? No, that's quite, you know, potentially quite a difficult question, but maybe you might have some ideas. Oh, yeah, um, feel free to jump on this one. Um, so in fact, what happened is, is that that password would have been reused somewhere some time ago. And what then have happened is that that, that site itself would have been compromised. Um, so what they'll, they'll have done is say, okay, if we use um, LinkedIn, obviously it was kind of hacked several years ago, and there was a lot of information um, taken from LinkedIn. Um, what will happen is, is that that password that would be used on LinkedIn would have been reused somewhere else. Um, so effectively what they tend to do is say, well, well we know you've, you've got the same email address, you're still using it now, this was the password you had at the time, and we're going to bet nine out of ten times you're going to still be using that same password somewhere else, and they send it across. Um, I, I imagine at some point it wouldn't be a very nice email, um, in terms of kind of threats to uh, friends and family with regards to um, activity email that have taken uh, on your laptop, because um, we've seen a, a few of those, um, but that's the reason why. Um, in terms of this, and I don't know if this kind of uh, helps Pascal in terms of kind of what we can do, there's, there's actually, uh, again, a very good kind of um, open source kind of website um, seeing um, how I've been pwned. Um, again, kind of a much kind of uh, geek speak there, um, but effectively that will give, you can type in your email address and it'll tell you if your email address has been used in any hacks um, nationally. Uh, internationally um so it, it, and then it says okay well this is the attack that was used in this is the system that was hacked but also likewise this is the password that they used um so it, oh they've got access to so if we can put that in the chat or use that later on that that would be very useful to us for everyone to see it so what is it called again I, I've, um, just ch- I've just chucked in the chat there to the panelists um, 
But it, it, just to give some background on this website as well, uh, it's, it's run by a guy called uh, Troy Hunt, who's over in sunny Australia. Lucky him. <laughs> but um, he's worked with the security industry for years. He, he quite often gets in the forefront of these breaches. Um, I mean, at the moment, they're sitting with nearly 10 billion accounts and passwords where they, they can tell you you've been, you've been checked against. Um, and that's it. It is just a drop in the ocean, though. So if, if you know that there's been a password emailed, please change it anywhere you can think of. You yeah. can be going back years at this point because we all have a digital footprint, old email addresses on Yahoo or AOL back in the day. And unfortunately, we, we can't ever really guarantee that is 100% with the certainty where they've got your password from, um, especially with you might have just used it once on a webinar or on a quick sign up website. And unfortunately, they may well have been hacked down the line. Um, just to give some examples, some of these breaches are major organizations such as Adobe, LinkedIn, and you can imagine the scale of the amount of professionals that are using these sites and to have those professional websites with a work email address. Um, and not only that, you can then trace where they are now on LinkedIn you can, you can then find out right there, they're now with this corporation down the road or this charity and they're now reusing the same password. So they just update the details to this person's email address and use it. Okay, thanks for that. Next question, please, Stephen. No problem. And um, we've had a couple of the guys talking about hotspots. Um, obviously, I think we covered that quite a lot. Um, but just the clarity, just to kind of paraphrase all that together, you guys would obviously recommend using mobile data hotspots as opposed to public Wi-Fi if possible. Yes. Um, again, for, for the deployment tool, we've had um, clients who are, are linked with the public sector. Um, again, we've recommended that. So whether they've been peripatetic, they've been kind of in a, in a wide variety of locations, we've, re we've recommended use hotspots. Um, uh, and again, we discussed things with kind of Vodafone in terms of how things were kind of enabled then, uh, obviously, which was the private provider at the time. And they said, yeah, fine, it's, it's kind of the security is, is, is kind of guaranteed. Um, I think, again, as Stephen said, alluded to before, in terms of kind of sharing with that password in terms of um, um, that, that, that component, either rotate the password on, the, on your device um, or don't give out the password. Um, that would be the, 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 the advice there. Thanks. Next one, please, Stephen. Fantastic. So Pamela just saying that, um, what are your thoughts about ESET, Endpoint Bundle, Antivirus? Currently, I've not seen any data breaches, Twitchwood, and that's with over 500 users for over a year. What's your thoughts on that? Have you heard of that? Yes, it's definitely one of the better solutions out in the market. Um, since we are getting at names, uh, our, our personal preference is always Bitdefender. They, they have a multi-layered approach, but ESET also offers that, that level of protection. Um, they are a vendor we've engaged with, and I was very impressed with them, yes. Excellent. There you go. Next, Perfect. please, Stephen. <laughs> and you also just mentioned uh, malware bytes as well. Um, any thoughts on, on that software? I'll, I'll take this one again then. Um, so <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's a good solution, um, but it isn't what you would class as your typical antivirus. They aren't looking for the same sort of indicators as what the other engines are, um, although it does often find things that the antivirus engines aren't looking for. They do tend to focus more on potentially unwanted programs to, to add a buzzword, which, it, which is things like browser redirections when you go into Google. So you type your search site and it's not taking you to Google, it's taking you to you know a, a fake Google where they're getting appeared to redirect your traffic to. Um, it, it is one of those solutions where you, you can use it in conjunction with another antivirus. So if you, if you want to add another layer to it, yes, feel free to use Malwarebytes. Um, even if you do just use the free edition and don't pay them, feel free to run a scan on occasion. You'll probably find something, it might just be something minor, but it, it's definitely worth to get that validation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments or questions, please, Stephen? Yeah, a couple of last ones, I think, guys. Um, just Charlotte's saying here, um, she has a Shopify website. Should I be doing anything to back that up or protect it? Or is that already taken care of by Shopify? I've got this one. I'm a big fan of Shopify, so <laughs> <laughs> in terms of, kind of what they do, um, again, in terms of uh, certainly from an e-commerce point of view, I think it's, for, uh, it's a kind of an all-in-one solution. So um, it's, as I say, kind of a big fan of it. Um, it's all taken care of by um, Shopify. I think, again, the only change of that would be in terms of if you export anything from Shopify. So appreciate it, of course. You'll have your orders in there. You'll have your products. Um, you'll have, um, again, potentially, um, obviously, uh, customer um, email addresses and details. I think the, the consideration would then be if you've got anything offline um, in terms of downloaded to your device, is either delete that um, if you don't use it anymore um, or, again, save that to a place where you may need it. Um, as I say, kind of an email, again, getting, someone getting access to, to from that perspective, if you're taking orders and it's got, again, full name and details as we know, kind of Shopify can kind of take, um, just be wary of what you're taking out of the platform. 
uh, and kind of where that's been stored. Yeah, very sensible. Thank you very much. Was there any, anything else at all from the chat room, uh, Stephen? A couple of last ones, guys. Um, Stephen Barrett just made a comment here that um, he had somebody set up a spoof of his website. They were um, a .com instead of .co.uk. He traced them in to go daddy and email them about it, but they refused to do anything about it. So quite worrying. It's a very interesting one, and it's definitely one that we see all the time. Um, usually, they do get shut down uh, because it, it's an impersonation of someone big, such as Microsoft or IBM or another organization that have large legal teams behind them. Um, if it's definitely GoDaddy who's hosting the domain, they do usually have an abuse at email address. And I believe, um, yep, they have a phishing at GoDaddy.com, and they also have uh, malware at GoDaddy.com and abuse at GoDaddy.com. But you will be able to contact what the, what they class as their administration addresses, and it's usually much more helpful than the support lines. The support lines tend to get hit with, you know, I've lost a website, I paid a web developer, and uh, they're not giving me the domain. Unfortunately, they, they know not to engage with those kind of queries, whereas ones that are actively pretending to be you, um, you can lodge a complaint against them officially. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much for the question though. That brings it alive and makes it just more, more kind of concrete for all of us. So um, I'd like to move on to segment two in the time that we've got left um, together. And this is more my reflection on thank you by the way for all the great advice you've given us you know i feel like we'll be able to take informed um, actions to mitigate and remove the low-hanging fruits and, re and remove the kind of uh, the way in for people either that, that be accidental or, or criminal but i suppose i, I was re i wanted to reflect on the discussion that we had offline before this session on what does best practice look like in 2020, 2021 for all of us as we're becoming better equipped to deal, to deal with um, online threats. And from memory, you were, you were talking about you know, three key elements. So can I begin with you, David? And what is, in your view, best practice? What does it look like moving forward? I think the, one of the things, I suppose, if we look at kind of the, the regulatory bodies, I think it kind of, if we had the, the, their first thing, like, so there, there's obviously now in terms of kind of how things have been established, we, um, in terms of the regulatory aspects, one is, is about kind of the information commissioner's office. So that itself is about, do you process any personal data? Um, so they themselves provide um, a lot of information with regards to how you can conduct yourself with regards to cybersecurity, um, regardless of the size of your organization and regardless if you're a, a, a kind of a, a person uh, or organization. Their remit is about the security of information that pretty much pertains to individuals. That's very much kind of their remit. Or again, where information which is processed uh, about information. Um, how, what they then do is they, they then dovetail themselves um, into GDPR. So if you know kind of GDPR came, uh, it was very much kind of Y2K, um, how big will this be, kind of how small would it be, what are the implications? Um, and in some cases there are, depending on the organizational size, there are some big implications, some big um, um, kind of thought processing um, thought provocations that kind of need to happen as part of this um, uh, implementation. But so likewise, it's about, again, have you followed your uh, due diligence? Are you doing the right things in terms of that, that process? Um, so certainly in terms of our, um, sorry, how they dovetail together, um, in terms of getting um, support from the ICO, um, which I think, if it's okay with you, Stephen, I think if you give a kind of a real world example where you've had to get in touch with the ICO and, and the process is there. Um, but again, the ICO won't provide you any um, support if, for example, one key element is not fulfilled, and that key uh, element is about encryption. So if you have a device which you leave in a coffee shop, uh, which is not encrypted, the ICO will not give you any support or, or help around that um, in terms of kind of their process. So it, it, in, in terms of how we kind of, again, kind of how we link that, that kind of process together is, are you kind of um, following um, guidance that's uh, promoted by um, GDPR? And offer you to kind of participate fully within GDPR to say, yes, we have a, either a tick box up to say, yes, we are observing the requirements with regards to GDPR. We need to have encrypted devices, which the ICO support. But obviously that in itself is then all underpinned by uh, obviously kind of ISO standards. So there are effectively kind of international standards, which we're not advocating obviously kind of organizations to go out and just say, yes, and embark on this project and let's do this. But there are certain guidelines, there are certain controls as they call them, which are deemed mm -hmm. as best practice to see, okay, can, can we follow this? So have you looked at password policies? So again, kind of how we got easy passwords, strong passwords. Um, in terms of our um, email, is it protected? Do we have these things in place? Do we have encryption in place? So a lot of the kind of the, the risks and kind of um, we identified kind of earlier in the session 
again, there are certainly kind of controls in place which help uh, govern these. Um, that admittedly has obviously spawned a kind of entire industry on the back of that, where they're not being, they're being very much kind of technical driven in terms of solutions. Um, that's enabled that kind of industry to kind of grow. But at the same time, there are some kind of very much some rich pickings from this, which could be applied to organisations of any size, whether or not be kind of, uh, kind of again, kind of one man organisations up to um, kind of a conglomerate level. So there are certain kind of elements between it. So for me, I suppose to kind of define wise, it would be the ICO, um, asking anybody if they do put, um, kind of process any information, please register with the ICO. Um, it's 30 pounds per year. Can I, <laughs> can I just a, ask, so, um, can, no, no, sincerely, what is meant when you say processing information? What, what is meant by that? Good, good, good question. So that could be, um, are we storing information anywhere about our clients? Are we still storing any, and, and with that, are we then doing something with that information? So what we've done first is we've processed that we've, we've, we've looked at that data, we've used that data for a purpose to do something. So that could be processing an order. We're storing some information about Pascal. Here is Pascal's uh, name and address. Here's his email, email address. We're now converting his order uh, into uh, a fulfilled order, if you use the Shopify example before. Um, so we've kind of gone through that process. We've got something about Pascal, where he lives, something about... We take it from a state of kind of being something which is digital and we've, we've actioned upon that data. Um, and that itself, obviously, again, could be followed through. Again, much of the aspects around information security, security is about the aspect of, of data processing effectively. Who has that data? Who has access to that data? Who is doing something with it? Is that financial and just, data? Exactly? And just to cut to, to the chase, I suppose, is it possible to run a business nowadays without processing data? Uh, no, because again, because you've got invoices, so again, you've got, you've got supply details within mm -hmm. there. If you've got employees, Again, prime example, even with just one employee, and whether that be your spouse, you kind of again kind of someone in your immediate family, you've got their personal details. So again, hypothetically, and this is kind of the, the type of debate that we tend to have, is what happens when this kind of this data is lost. Whether that be kind of in a system which is on your local device, what if you're using a third party tool um, to run your payroll, that gets hacked. It can kind of all these kind of aspects of where it is. The analogy that Stephen said before about the onion doesn't just apply to kind of the technical aspect. Again, it gets a link to the business itself in terms of its information security, which then applies, of course, to individuals. So is it one individual, just 10 individuals? So we kind of can see this kind of mushroom and grow. Um, I, as, I say, as I said before, kind of the ICO registration, it's 30 pounds per year. Again, depending on organization size, turnover, that sort of thing. But it's, sorry, it's, they've, they've upped it now, I think, to 40 pounds. Sorry. Um, but again, that's just, it, it, it's, it's like, for us, how we treat that, um, it's very much like your, um, employer liability certificate so again you know obviously a lot of businesses kind of have this kind of stuck up for us is okay if you have this side by side um it, it, it again gives this air that you're kind of caring about the data that you have um because it is personal um it can be used for the, again for nefarious kind of purposes uh, but again it's just whilst you care about your employees and care about kind of the, the data that you may have about them or again likewise clients super well thanks for that it's a very good reminder for, for all of us um so that's an element of the new normal and best practice um, Stephen, is there something else that comes to mind that, be, that would become part of what we need to embrace more as all managers of businesses? Kind of the logic of it, it, it is going to happen at some point. So what we would typically class it as an IT side is kind of a disaster planning. Um, it, it's around what steps you would take to remediate it, what you'll do to fix it how you're going to handle an incident when it does actually occur much like your building burns down and you've got a plan for let's move down the road to the coffee shop <laughs> you, you you need to have a plan for what happens when you, you have an outbreak or a staff member opens a phishing email and does chuck their credentials into it and um, when you've got these things planned and rehearsed you, you can get them down to minutes in terms of fixing them whereas when they happen and you're not prepared you can be talking hours just to know well how do i look at this okay, I need to go here. And then you're down another rabbit warren of uh, what's gone on over here. Uh, like I say, a lot of these ADR solutions um, or you know other solutions such as uh, security operations center backed software, they monitor these for you. They tell you, John Smith has opened an email and we've detected that someone's tried to log in from China. Um, you do tend to find these monitored solutions are a lot of money um, in, in terms of when you add the, the resource to actually monitor them and tackle these incidents. But we are starting to see a massive drive down in cost to even just a few pounds a month and you can monitor exactly what's running on the computers, what it's touching and working with. And 
you, you get actionable intel and fixes on these devices. Um, there are other solutions that monitor your Office 365 instances, and they, they will tell you that we've had unexpected logins. Um, are you expecting someone from China to log into the CEO's account? No, um, it's been hacked. So therefore, they lock them out of the system. Um, there will be a drive to kind of as, get these solutions in place as time goes on. It, it, it's something we've seen, especially with the ICU, uh, if you've got PCI compliance because you've got card terminals, or it, even if you're subscribing to ISO 27001 or one of the information security standards, um, the layers need to come in, the, the need to protect the data. You need to be able to say what happened with the data. You need to be able to validate that that data hasn't left the organization or if it has where it went to um, and it's very much a layered approach with things like data loss prevention tools they know where the data is they protect the data they encrypt the data and those sort of solutions are going to become very commonplace even down on the small business level that that's our goal in five and ten years that the, the solutions are there everyone has them and in, in reality we're, we're going to work ourselves out with a job hopefully eventually <laughs> <laughs> sorry to say that david but uh, that, that that is the goal because if, if we if we can better everyone's approach to it it's going to become harder and harder for the criminals and it's far too easy to smash a window on a car and walk out with you know a, a laptop if it's mm. not encrypted your data's out there yeah there was uh, um, another element to best practice um David, that you know, you mentioned to me, which is this idea of almost like all digital skills, except that it's going to change and move on with the times, and therefore be prepared to you know uh, educate yourself on an ongoing basis and make regular adjustment to your practices. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think because it, as, as again kind of a, a mentioned kind of earlier, I think the focus, of course, is that um, criminals aren't going to change. Um, in terms of kind of what people can do kind of with that data that's not going to change um it, 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 regardless of kind of that's in kind of um it, kind of a pre-covid world or kind of a post-covid world um that will again continually uh, progress um i think Stephen kind of again kind of alluded there there, there are these kind of again these changing trends certainly kind of in, in the last kind of 11 years we've seen kind of massive changes um in terms of um how organizations may or may not ad adopt um, certain processes again, how they change themselves. So again, we've got, obviously got long-standing uh, long clients where kind of in their, their infancy, uh, they were very kind of, um, they had a very healthy risk appetite, um, shall we say. And again, obviously as they begin to kind of grow themselves, they said, okay, well actually we need to kind of look at our risk appetite in, in all aspects of the, of the, of the business. And of course that includes our information security, our cyber security and the components as a result of that. Um, so there, there is something about kind of the, as you say the kind of the, the self education component, um, where again if, if if we can help with that just by kind of running more of these sessions, uh, perhaps you know, just that sort of thing again, um, or again if again it's even alluded before about this kind of self education about again being aware of kind of where things are, um, if we can point you to different resources, um, different websites that say okay well have you done this have you checked this again that just becomes a, a kind of a signpost to say well this is beginning to become best practice. Um, there's some excellent practitioners out there. And again, there's a lot of people out there who kind of do, just do it for the, for the thrill of the chase, um, very much like ourselves. Um, and again, which kind of, again, as we've mentioned before, uh, our goal is to kind of, is to not do this in kind of like five, 10, 15 years because everyone's doing it. It becomes the best practice. So rather mm. than have someone external say, well, okay, this is how best practice should be. It should be, well, no, in reality, we're doing it this way. Um, one, one example I kind of always kind of apply right now in terms of kind of the reward is is I'm slowly becoming kind of an expert on HR, and um, so I'm not an HR expert in any any ways, but again, kind of where we are now, I have to be. You know, again, that's was that's kind of where other people may kind of say, well, I've already been, I've already had this knowledge in, in HR because as a business owner, kind of this is how we progressed it. Um, but again, I'm kind of doing the firefighting bit where kind of being things have happened now. We'll actually ask the question, well. Is everything there in place and kind of have I kind of followed those processes and procedures? The same applies to kind of information security. Um, it's that same aspect from a business leader perspective. It's this this kind of this polymath approach. We need to have kind of all these different skills and approaches. And information security is being it's not kind of a natural evolution, it's been very much kind of just kind of shoehorned in there because it has to be. It's kind of emerged more or less overnight in terms of how the techniques have been applied. Um, and I think this kind of this this constant learning, this constant evolution, this constant reconfiguration of the organization in response to kind of uh, cyber criminals is obviously kind of the, one of the, the better ways to go. Um, examples which have been given so far have been excellent because yeah, we thought, again, the question which have been asked is, we've asked about security, we've thought about security. Um, so they're very much kind of on the, this journey. 
um, this hellish journey that <laughs> this interface security. No, no, I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm with you because, I mean, it's complex enough and demanding enough as it is to run your own business. And there's immense pleasure in, of course, taking you know, control of your destiny and offering an amazing service out there. And we, 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 we can do without the inconvenience of losing hours and days dealing with something that really uh, on occasion is no fault of our own. It's just, you know, I mean, I think that the radio program yesterday was, you know, the, the, the guest was making good sense saying, um, you know, you, you, you will become a, a victim at some stage. We hope it doesn't happen, but you will become a victim. And that's where you are. And, and I think all, to get, uh, all too often we can feel guilty uh, because something that we haven't done. But when you've done everything, and yet the criminal mind has managed to kind of win on this occasion, but back to your point, um, Stephen, but you've, you've got a plan for that. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. you've got a plan for incidents that can happen around the house, around the building and so on and so forth. And you, you have one for, for, for that. So um, I'm going to turn to our audience again, and we're going to move on to the, 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 the end of that segment number two. So if you have some additional questions or thoughts you want to share, please put them in the chat um, box making sure you choose panelists and all attendees so we can all see that and i would invite Stephen to read them out but I, I was kind of um so i spent time wondering about what's happening with the world of online marketing and online customer service that's my specialism i'm wondering uh, i think i know the answer to that whether you're spending time uh, looking at the near future of your particular specialism and industry and I wonder whether you had any thoughts and reflection, and I'll begin with you, Stephen, about what, what's you know, around the corner for you, the type of work you're doing and maybe how you might uh, um, face different threats altogether and maybe you're going to have different solutions for it. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it, 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 to take the fire analogy from earlier, um, it is very much a fire hose. The, the amount of information coming out of the industry is unreal. Um, even if you just sign up the Twitter and follow the information security side of things, there is a lot of activity. There's a lot of change on the ground all the time. Um, in terms of that, it's just the comprehensive approach of layering the solutions. I know I've said it before, but get, getting these things in and then having them validated, that that's where the future is going to be. If, if you've done PCI compliance, you'll all know when you've had your card terminals put into the network that they've done a network scan against you. They'll use terms like CDE, the card data environment and things like that to, to basically dictate, yes, you, you've, you've done these tasks. We know the, the terminals are isolated and we know that we've scanned your network they know that there are no vulnerabilities. Um, and, and then if you do have them, it's just remediating them. It's, it's the remediation that's becoming the big aspect. And unfortunately, some of these old solutions, that they're very expensive to replace. But on the other side, some of them are very easy hits that get you a lot of change and a lot of more security on the doors of things. Um, just to give you an example as well, uh, we had a customer who was sitting there with legacy equipment. They hadn't upgraded uh, for about 15 years and they just kept the same wireless points, the same network infrastructure. Um, unfortunately, they had some employees who were uh, very apt at getting around the protections that were there and they were, they were using these to do things that you potentially don't want on a business network such as torrenting. Um, Things like next generation firewalls is, is this the next step um, because they, they can monitor this sort of traffic. They, they can prevent this sort of traffic from going on and off of your network. And when, when you're able to go back and say, yes, we prevented this, you can then find the root cause and deal with it. It might be a person, it might be a bit of uh, an old bit of hardware that you've realized, oh, oh we've had this squirreled away in the, in the ceiling tiles um, and no one ever realized. But you, you will find aspects that need improvement on every level. For those of us who are not sure, what is the role of a firewall? How does that work? It, it, it is your gateway to, to the internet. It, it is your final piece of protection before you're out there. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, get, you get a whole scale of them from just basic, these are packet filters, so they deal with the bits of data that are flying around the network, and then it comes to them all the way up to the next generation uh, firewalls and what they would class as the UTM suite where the, they're checking the DNS query for google.com or google.co.uk. Is it a malicious domain? Are we aware of any sort of traffic going back? They're doing checks to see is there, is there a botnet at this Russian IP and it goes yes and it blocks it. Um, it's also doing web filtering and interception and antivirus scans of the content before it even hits your device. So all you get is extra layers to the protection. They'll, 
and those extra layers are, are obviously what, what we're all looking for. We hope that these extra layers are, are going to prevent, because it's, it's always an if, it, it's always going to be if this happens. And all we can hope for is that we minimize the loss. Thank you very much. David, any reflection on the near future for you guys? It seemed very doom and gloom. Um, but I, I, know, I think it's kind of one of the things we're, we're trying to kind of obviously kind of to, to move away is, is just kind of painting this picture of kind of dystopia. No, I, I think it's it's certainly not weird. I think um, from a future point of view, um, I, I think obviously the uh, and everyone will have heard obviously the aspect of kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll enter an era where it's not done by the human directly. Um, it'll be about kind of people plugging away. Um, as you said that before, the bots in terms of kind of the, 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 the articles you kind of pulled up before in terms of how they've been recommended to you. So imagine um, to the case where people will begin to see your, your online activities. They'll know that you switch out your kind of laptop at nine, you go for a kind of a, a, a stroll at 11 o'clock. They'll, they'll begin to kind of realize this in terms of your habitual kind of um, um, habits. Um, so they'll begin to kind of target, it become more effective. So once it was now done by a human to kind of scour through um, certain things will all be done by uh, very much the, the machine component. Um, I think it, one of the other things that's probably kind of on the horizon, which could be deemed as kind of a, both a kind of a, a risk, but also likewise an opportunity um, is the, the cloud migration. Um, so where once upon a time we may have had solutions kind of which are very much kind of deemed inside our organizations on our devices. Um, we have the ability now to obviously kind of leverage that within the cloud. Um, from a opportunity point of view, that's great. You know, there's kind of less risk inside the organisation. Oh, of course, um, we always say that um, a, a cloud is just someone else's server uh, somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so, in some cases, that could be okay again. About the due diligence of the supplier you're using. Um, again, likewise, what controls might be in place to to stop that being kind of um, accessed by everyone? But also, likewise, there could be some case about the actual misconfiguration of moving to the cloud. Um, it's very easy to just to kind of click next, next, next in terms of uh, cloud um, infrastructures and cloud systems and services. But does that leave a kind of a gaping black hole somewhere for someone just to kind of uh, to pile in uh, and to use that? Um, so certainly kind of how the, the future of that kind of looks as well. Um, we, we think that kind of, as I say, presents itself as both a kind of a, a risk and an opportunity um, in terms of kind of where things are headed. So, so. I mean, my, my world of online marketing and online customer service is kind of looking with great interest at AI and machine learning and automation, um, the promise of making life easier and more relevant to, to many of us. Is that also part of the consideration when it comes to cybersecurity? Yeah, yeah. I, th I, think, but for, for, I think for two reasons. I think, it, obviously, the, the aspect of cybersecurity is kind of very much kind of this front door at your house. There is obviously other kind of components as part of cybersecurity, which include information security. So again, if you think, again, from an AI perspective with regards to using Twitter, uh, again, having, having Twitter bot there, having Hootsuite send things at certain different times, that sort of thing as well. There's components of kind of machine learning and AI based within that. Um, there's the, the reverse aspect here, which is about, okay, well, how does your customers feel about that? How do they feel in which you could be kind of involved with something which is around the big brother aspect? But that in itself kind of leads back to kind of the whole cybersecurity aspect. Again, very much, yes, we have to operate. Yes, there are, again, our, our kind of um, our responsibilities to kind of to run the organization. But we also have a responsibility to our customers. Uh, and again, how they feel and how our clients feel, and again, kind of how are we kind of engaging with those? So, there's, I suppose we're subjecting kind of our clients in that same way to kind of things like kind of uh, AI and, and, and machine learning a lot. Um, it becomes the kind of the new, um, the new fashion, feel like in terms of kind of. Uh, <laughs> IT no, no, that's, that's right. <laughs> and, and Steve, you know, you were talking about the um, the layers, um, which I think is a great image. Do you see a situation where, through, you know, forgive me, AI and machine learning? Um, new layers are almost creating themselves, uh, learning from the attacks on your on your systems and that kind of thing. So you, you could almost buy a service, which um, is a strange uh, kind of statement, but is alive, which is that whenever there's a, an attack that even is kind of newer, it yep. learns from that and creates uh, stronger defenses. Do you see that happening, Stephen? Yes, um, it, it, it's happening today, thankfully. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of advanced tools out of there where they are doing uh, excellent machine learning and the good thing is you can chuck unknown attacks um, and the, these 
devices, these bits of software are taking these attacks and they know already these are using indicators. They're, they're using these common things that we always see in these attacks and they're actively blocking them. And that's without pushing an antivirus update or a, you know, a software definition update to, the, to whatever it's protecting. Um, they, they already know these are typical indicators and it deals with it instantly. You just end up with the report and an email saying, yes, we've protected you 57 times today. Excellent. Um, any final questions from our attendees? Please put them in, in the chat box for us, and then I will probably get Stephen to kind of jump in. I wanted to actually ask you something closely aligned to uh, earlier comments you, you made, David, around your own, actually, uh, privacy. You know, maybe that's where it begins. So we know that a lot of people will be using um, Google for some reason, and therefore have a Google account. And I wanted to get your views on if you can be bothered and if you take the time with a glass of wine and your comfy slippers on, you can actually go into your Google account and control an enormous amount of the parameters and what information is tracked. Indeed, you can actually um, ask to be forgotten um, if you see fit. Um, is that worth um, someone's time to go into the Google settings and control what is being tracked about, about what they do or not on the internet? So, so this is where kind of between Stephen and I, you get kind of two differing. Uh, oh, approaches. right. Well, we'll get your view, David. So, so obviously, for, for me, in terms of so, in the nicest way possible, um, I'm very ambivalent at that that's kind of activity. I realise kind of again the the business model that Google has that they are effectively a, a data processing organisation. Um, there, there, the whole reason for existence is about kind of data and and advertising, and, and I get that. Um, it would be very remiss, again, from a kind of a business point of view to say, okay, let's kind of, um, I, suppose, I suppose I need to say this right, but kind of interfere kind of with their business model per se. Um, of course, what Google has succumbed to is GDPR. So GDPR certainly within, from an EU point of view, but also GDPR from a California state point of view as well. So this is why they've put, put their kind of um, regulations in place. Um, I think, so Personally, I, I understand kind of what that, that data is used for. I understand kind of what it's there for. Um, I obviously as well understand kind of what the risks are. So that may be kind of my, I suppose my, my kind of, my get out of jail card in terms of kind of my attitudes towards this is that I understand kind of what that data is, what it's there for and again, what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything bad, I promise. Um, so I, by the same time, I've got nothing to hide. Um, but also likewise, in terms of my kind of online, uh, online activity, could that be exploited for anything else? Potentially, and this is where Stephen and I kind of differ on our views, uh, because I look at the good side of the human and say this is kind of again how how this data should be kind of used. Um, Stephen's treatment because it's true. Um, Stephen also very much kind of looks at the the bad side of the, of the, the human. So let's go to Stephen a, then. Tell us about the bad side of humanity. <laughs> what we should be careful about then. That, that, that's a rather positive note to start out on. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean. <sighs> The problem is they're always collecting data. They're always looking at what they can advertise towards you because they're offering a free service. So if you've got a Gmail account, you know there is a fine print there that says that they're going to look at certain things about the metadata of what you're sending and receiving. Um, likewise, you're kind of accepting that I'm not paying anything for this, so I'm going to continue to use it. There has to be a trade-off, unfortunately. Um, where I feel the oversteps is when, it, when it's used at the level and the capability that the likes of Google, Microsoft and such have. Um, they are thankfully getting better with GDPR and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's nice to see that they are finally kind of reining in the data use and how, how they actually do it but just to give you an example um, th th there are stories out there on Twitter where people have been searching for terms and then you find that they're getting personalized adverts and it's all the big data behind it so you you've searched for this product therefore you must be pregnant or you've searched for this product therefore you're looking for a new car or will be looking for a new car because it's on its last legs these sort of trends are how they're using this data and i mean it, it doesn't worry some people it also it, it kind of it is a scary thing to think of that there is all this data about us in the ether, in the cloud. Someone else's server has all this data about me. It has this data about you. Do, do you really care about it? Uh, some people do because, prime example, uh, there was a case on Twitter recently where someone was pregnant. They unfortunately miscarried. And for months afterwards, the trends were seeing 
you, you are pregnant, therefore we're going to chuck pregnancy related advertising towards you. We're mm. going to send products in your email. And I, it's a very upsetting time for that individual to have that big data targeted in that way. Um, it, it literally took some engineers from the company in question to deal with that on Twitter. and They went and sorted it out for their teams. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of a presentation I gave many years ago, actually, it was back in Leeds. And I don't know, I, I felt contentious that day. And I, the title was um, Automation Makes You Look Dumb. And it was all about, at the time, the big rise in automating everything around marketing and forgetting the human you know, element of, can we stop for a moment and wonder whether or not this is wise? And I had countless examples, not as dramatic as this one, about automation making a company look dumb. I remember once it was uh, actually my friends from um, PayPal who sent me an email saying, you have money in your account, go and, and spend it. I was like, wow. Have they given, gifted me some money because I knew they didn't have any money at all. So I got a bit excited, right? Um, so I went in and sure enough, I had one penny. <laughs> and I was thinking, which was essentially what was left of a purchase from uh, weeks, weeks ago. And I realized thinking, well, surely it must be within their that kind of, you know, mental capacity to put a rule in place to say, if whatever is left in someone's PayPal account is less than a, a tenner, let's not, war, you know, let's not send that email out saying you've got some money, go spend it. And that's what I mean by automation makes you look dumb. And I think that's, uh, uh, we're only going to learn by, by, by making mistakes. Uh, I'm going to ask you one question. I'm going to turn to Stephen. Do you believe, or is it true, that if I'm talking to my friends and my phone is on, somebody listens to me, and then I get some adverts that relate to the conversation, conversation I've had. So I'm asking Stephen yes. and, and, and David, yes. I'm not asking, <laughs> you know, Vital Service North is Limited. I'm asking personally, does it listen to me? And is it why I'm going to get some adverts now for the next two weeks about cybersecurity and, and what software to use? What, yes. what say you, Stephen? No, don't, don't ask him first. The devices are always listening. So if you've got an Alexa, you've got Siri or anything like that, they are always listening for those keywords. Um, they do supposedly discard the data. Um, whether or not you believe them discarding the data, I, I, it, it's one until it's proven for me. Uh, but th this is my paranoid side. Okay, I've, David, I've got what do you say? Uh, yeah, yes, I totally agree. Um, I think um, my academic interest is about kind of privacy online. Um, so that's kind of what it is. Uh, at some point, um, you'll have agreed to do that. But that's a problem. So I think about this is where, um, again, tech companies themselves, they, they put kind of um, strenuous terms and conditions in place. So what you're doing is just saying, accept. Um, so, and within that acceptance would have been, yes, well, on the, I, I on, the plus, on the plus side, because Dennis, my wife and I use a similar you know, uh, system. We work on, this, on the business. So if I keep talking about what I want for Christmas, Yes. <laughs> the adverts, then uh, of my birthday in October, we should get the adverts, and then I get what I want. Uh, if, if, if you see it in, in, in earshot of her or a phone, I'll just shout at her phone. I just <laughs> or keep using her phone for two weeks. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. please, please, and then she gets the adverts, and that, that becomes obviously something that she's going to get me. All right, um, Stephen, Stephen Fennick, do we have some questions from our lovely audience? Been really uh, great today. We do have one or two, yes. Um, I think a few people have maybe had a few problems getting the questions into the chat. For, for oh, right. I'm totally sure. Um, I've not done anything to disable it, so perhaps um, Zoom is just having a bit of a, a strange uh, kind of half an hour or something. But we have got a few in the Q&A section, so feel free, guys, if you're not getting any joy through chat, then just pop it straight into the Q&A bit. Um, we can just ask from there as well. That's no problem. Um, so we got um, a question here um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, which is just asking, what are your views about storing passwords on a Google account? Do you want to take this, David, or should I? Stephen, I'll, 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 I'll take it first. Stephen, it's, it's an anonymous <laughs> question, so you're the guy that loves anonymity. So. Um, the passwords tend to be synced up to a Google account. So when you sign in and chuck your Google address in, the, the passwords are stored. They are up in the cloud. They are stored on the cloud. Um, and obviously, if anyone ever gets access to your account, they can't access them. Um, Likewise, if anyone gets access to your computer, they, they can just go straight into the Google settings. They can pull up those passwords. Yes, they might have to enter a Windows password, but if they've had access to the device for a few days and they know that password, it, it's not a roadblock to them getting elsewhere. Um, dedicated password managers are the better sort of side of that thing. So much 
like LastPass, One Password, um, Dashly, and there are there are dozens of tools out there. Again, don't take a recommendation for me uh, about the specific one. Go and read and have a look and see what you think about how they store the passwords. They often have this on the, on their tool. This is how we store your data. This is how we encrypt it. This is how we protect it. Uh, what I will say is I do very much like the model where they never know the password. All they get is an encrypted string, and there are quite a few password managers like Pat, One Password, Dashly, and that do that. So the, the service themselves can never know your password or details. They just know it's an encrypted string and you have a device specific password on your device that ensures they never get that. It's always an anonymous string, an encrypted string to them. Super. Would you mind whilst um, David takes the next question to write down the, the short list of um, platform that we should investigate for ourselves and study? If you don't mind putting that in, in the chat area. Um, Stephen, all the names you've mentioned a moment ago. Um, no Stephen, number two, can we have a question for David, please? No problem. Yes, we've got a question from Aaron as well. Um, so he uses um, iCloud Keychain and Google Password saves often. The passwords are saved in Safari. But he also uses passwords created by them, which are usually kind of a number of hash marks, and it's and they're complicated. Most of the data is under a two-point verification process, either by mail, text, or app like Google Authenticator. Is this safe? Should we be doing more to secure passwords? That is a, um, a, a, a nigh on perfect example of kind of how, how to do the passwords. Um, everything. I think obviously because there are kind of, um, I suppose, several kind of kind of ecosystems there, if you like. So obviously iCloud being very much aligned to, to Apple. And again, as Steve said before, that's very much kind of in the cloud. But again, Apple stuck its two factor authentication stages even further. So that, that's, that's a better. Um, in terms of, I said, the, the only kind of niggle slightly would be around kind of the, is the, the with regards to the previous question, which is about using Chrome purely to save the passwords. I think the next layer would be is don't allow Chrome to save your passwords because mm. again, that could mean, and I appreciate again, Google's got two-factor authentication anyway. Um, but again, that could mean that we could log on to a PC as you spoof you, log in, get your passwords, and then we've got access to all your details. Um, the next layer of going again, to kind of taking that kind of further would be um, a, a kind of a password manager. Um, and the ones that Stephen have mentioned in the chat, um, those would be um, excellent examples of, of, of doing that. Um, so see, um, from the, the question that's been asked, um, kind of perfect response. If you want to take it that little bit further, then um, have a look at something like kind of um, one password, dash lane, um, those type of products. Thank you very much, David. Um, next question, please, Stephen. Yeah, I think there was one that I missed from previously um, from Simon. He was just asking, um, is Defender um, okay to use with Apple? Is yes, that Stephen, to, please? It, it could be several products um, because a lot, a lot of companies are using uh, Defender as the branding. Um, Microsoft has their, their platform for Defender. Um, so it, it, do we have any more specifics to that one? We don't, no. It, it just, I mean, if you'd like, if, Sam, if you'd like to put any more detail in around that in the, in the chat or on the Q&A, then feel free and hopefully we can get that answered for you. Um, and I think that's it, guys, for now. Okay, super. So could I ask... Um, Stephen, to maybe give us final thoughts and recommendations to help our communities in kind of Durham and Leeds City region to just move up a few notches in their understanding and practices of you know protecting and preventing cyber threats. What would be your, your top recommendations? Um, get, get a password manager is definitely one of them. Um, most, most so for if, if you've got an organization and want to spread that out um, and, and allow your staff to have it. We have a personally vital, uh, we have both a personal and a work account uh, paid for by Vital. Um, and the reason we did so is we were elevating ourselves. Um, what, what's the sense in selling all of these things to our clients and, and not eating our own dog food? Why are we reusing passwords? And that's a change we've done over years. So we don't have shared passwords. We we don't have typed passwords that were randomly invented on on the on that uh, moment. What we have is a master password and two factor that allows us to get to the vault of passwords. Mm -hmm. And those vaults we know are mostly secure. Um, again, have a look at the vendor and their specifics and how they do it. Um, in, in terms of early hanging fruits, like you say, it's it's always about the patching. It's always about having a, a good antivirus program. Elevating yourself with some sort of vulnerability assessment or vulnerability scan is the next level. 
at least then you you know exactly what's happening on your network on your devices because you can see what an attacker would see you can see the exact same sort of results and what the recommendations are to, to improve those um, unfortunately not all of these assessments are free um, which is a bit of a downside but they do often come with recommendations on how to resolve your issues and how, how to make yourself better um, same with active directory accounts if you've got servers on site um, who, who has administrator passwords, should they have administrator passwords? Do they have the right rights to the server and the data and all of, all of the services that run? It's all too common that I, I go into an organization blindly and you see there's an, there's an admin, as in an admin receptionist who has administrator rights because someone has misread or misinterpreted what their role is in the organization. Same as you often find they give them administrator rights um, in terms of when they update Sage rather than updating the software themselves. Um, unfortunately, those administrator rights allow you to get all the way through the network. So if, if that person opens a malicious attachment, th there's no stopping what they can touch, what they can break. And you often find this with crypto malware, um, which is things like you'll have heard WannaCry and uh, crypto locker they, they open they have the rights of the person if they've got administrator rights they can go and touch everything on that device they can go to the servers and then touch everything on there um, and th there are some uh, rather nasty variants that will actually sit on the network for weeks and months they will literally jump from machine to machine um, and you literally have the hardest time in the world removing them because they're, they're so well ingrained um, to coin a phrase from one of my friends I was speaking to last night at Microsoft, he was going to have to nuke and pave an, an entire customer's network because the, it had been sat on the network, it had got the admin level privileges, it had got to the backups on the servers, and it had compromised those backups. They had no data that they could restore back to on site. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask you, David, actually, to maybe focus on what we talked about. So. Let's get ourselves um, re-registered uh, with the ICO and yep. show interest in their recommendation and, and, and practices. We're going to find ways to keep ourselves informed where, where possible. What are your, again, your top recommendations based on our conversation today? I think the, the key thing is, um, is that we believe um, that we're not too far away from people ringing 999 to report cybercrime. Um, so in terms of kind of what's on the horizon. Um, but I think if we get back to our analogy about the Wild West, um, the Wild West was, wasn't kind of um, ran just by kind of outlaws. Um, there were elements of obviously police and sheriffs that were kind of, that could be used to be called upon to protect businesses um, against kind of malicious kind of activity. And I think if we kind of, if we again kind of use that analogy and apply that, I think that's kind of, again, that's very much kind of encompasses kind of what our um, potential kind of risks are, but also likewise, again, kind of what our opportunities are. Um, it's a community activity. It's no, no man is an island, kind of no one's left kind of on their own devices to kind of do this. Um, there are, again, kind of obviously free resources. Um, mm. Likewise, there are premium resources, but it's also likewise, it's very much kind of everyone's best interest to, again, to help their own organizations protect and, and, and obviously thrive. It's interesting you should use the um, you know, image of the 999 because only two days ago, my colleague Paul Clark was contacted by Northumbria Police and the Northeast Regional Cybercrime Unit with some uh, great information. Uh, I realized as I'm saying this, it sounds like it was in trouble far from it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Paul uh, <laughs> has actually been liaising with uh, the North Regional Cybercrime Unit uh, regularly to say, you must have some information or, or that would be of use to our local businesses. And what, what is interesting is for you know, businesses um, out there, for the duration of the pandemic and COVID-19, they are offering a free vulnerability assessment. And what they are asking you to do through a series of uh, registration, which is very, very light touch because I did it only yesterday, they're asking you to share your current and existing public IP address. And they're going to do a free assessment of anything that, that could actually um, potentially uh, happen using obviously um, techniques that would be known to you. So what I'm going to do is for everybody, I'm going to copy and paste the email address um, that you can use to show um, interest uh, in terms of being part of this free assessment during the period of uh, us working remotely. And I think it's playing to how we began this conversation by the increase in remote um, uh, location working, the increase in, in cyber attacks, and the need to upscale ourselves. And I think to have people like Northumbria Police and Northeast Regional Tribal Crime Unit interested is, is kind of nice. 
what I, what I will say is, whilst we do have some friends joining us today from the Leeds City region, um, do get in touch with them. If they can't help you, I would like to think that there would be the equivalent support and scheme in the Yorkshire region. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can see David nodding away. I, I'd imagine that most regions have organised themselves with their own cyber crime unit. Is that, is that the case? We certainly had a speech with the Northern, but the Northern Room was excellent um, in terms of, again, just from a partnership working from our perspective. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we, we've actually got a, a client uh, in, in North Yorkshire uh, who was involved with um, uh, North Yorkshire Police Service. So, um, we're no, obviously, if that's two different regions, as you see, there, there must be other equivalents. Um, but it, yeah. they're, they're very, very good. So, yeah. So listen, um, can I begin by thanking both of you, Stephen and David, for for your time today. Um, I have to say those webinars are becoming something that we all look forward to, to spend some time in each other's company as we are kind of um, stuck at home. I hope you've enjoyed it and the whole experience of chatting to me, to uh, my colleague Stephen, Paul and the others and, and our attendees. If and when our lovely um, audience live and on replay have further questions, what is the best way to get in touch with you and can continue the conversation? I'll start with you, David. And um, the, the best thing I think in terms of uh, reach, obviously, again, by kind of corporate links, if we can put our um, uh, email address, telephone number, kind of uh, website and things up uh, in terms of the chat, that, that helps as well. Um, we had a wonderful uh, slide pre- pre- prepared just in case <laughs> we came that, that point. Uh, we have one there. Um, so yes, yeah, so they're very much kind of the, the, the normal roots there. Um, and appreciate it. again. I'm just going to speak on behalf of Stephen. Stephen's very kind of very very active in the community, so you can find him on um, loads of weird, wonderful things. Um, so I'll, yeah. let him, I'll let him speak. <laughs> Stephen, yeah, so. how can we find you? Even though you, know, you tell us that you like to be anonymous on the internet, <laughs> that must be a way to find you, surely. Um, <laughs> it, it is one of those. I, I do have a Twitter account. Um, there is also LinkedIn as well. Uh, but on Twitter, my tag is at Stephen with a B underscore vital. Um, but like I say, feel free to catch me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, email as well, uh, Stephen at vitalservice.co.uk. And obviously, I'll, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Super. And I know that obviously it's just something that you guys, uh, you know, look into, keep yourself informed and so on. Out of interest, do you have any um, blog series going on? Any other resource that we can maybe tap into? Uh, so, do you want to answer that one, Stephen? <laughs> uh, not at present, uh, in development at the moment. <laughs> it's, so, it's, been, so, it's been an ongoing debate. I think kind of one, one of the kind of things about is, again, is, is kind of how again, how do we kind of, um, what, what's the correct kind of angle to kind of come with this? So again, we, we didn't want to kind of appear kind of preachy. We've been very open about that. We didn't want to come and say, okay, this is what it is. It's about kind of that best practice kind of aspect. And, and again, I think one of the things we've always struggled with is, is kind of how, how do we kind of, how do we go at it? Um, but it has been, it's been a long, long standing uh, discussion. That's all right. Uh, I know people, people. I know some people know about online marketing and blogging, so yeah. I can pass on some names <laughs> if you want. <laughs> so, listen. On behalf of the host organisation, Digital Drive County Durham and Digital Knowledge Exchange, and on behalf of our wonderful audience today here live and on replay, a huge thank you again for your time and for sharing your knowledge in a very honest and frank way. I think it's very, very refreshing. A subject that is going to stay with us for as long as, as long as we're trading and using the web, you know, for uh, good. Whilst yeah. of course we have to face <laughs> others who are maybe through accidents or in the criminality, uh, do something very, very different. So I'm going to you know, say goodbye to everybody and wish you all um, a very, very, you know, good times in current climate. And we hope to be able to see each other uh, properly in you know, very, very soon. Bye-bye for now. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.